10, 9, 8. A mysterious, happy sounding voice is counting down as a young man runs across a rotating beam. He is cut and bruised, leaving a trail of blood behind him as he struggles to reach the finish line. 7, 6, 5. He hops onto the final platform as a spinning saw blade comes buzzing out of the wall. He drops to the floor moments before it takes off his head. Four, three, two. He stands up and sprints towards the end of this nightmare competition. The man leaps through the air, his arm outstretched towards the buzzer. One, zero, time's up. The announcer cries a split second before the man slaps the final buzzer. The lights go out and the announcer's voice suddenly changes. It loses its clown-like quality and takes on a much more sinister tone. Looks like no winners this time. Now it's time for your punishment. Hi, I'm Dr. Bob, and this is SCP-024, also known as the Game Show of Death. SCP-024 is an abandoned soundstage, which is a hangar-like structure that's normally used for the production of film and television projects. This specific soundstage has been abandoned for a number of years, though it's not known at this time if the anomalous properties it demonstrates had manifested before or after its abandonment. The anomalous location was first discovered by a group of teenagers who had illegally broken into the compound on which the soundstage is located. Only one of the teenagers who entered the soundstage returned, and the report she made to local police detailing her experience was more than enough to tip off the SCP Foundation that something was amiss. The Foundation immediately began mobilizing agents, and once the site was secured, a number of test groups were sent into SCP-024 to learn more about what was happening inside. From those groups, we now know that upon entering SCP-024, visitors are greeted by an announcer who is so far yet to be seen or otherwise identified. The announcer communicates with the visitors via an intercom system, and will listen and respond back to visitors as well. The announcer refers to those who enter SCP-024 as contestants, and informs them that they will be participating in a game show with the opportunity to win fabulous prizes. The contestants are given fair warning, though, that the game will be extremely dangerous, and that only winners will be allowed to leave. At this point, the contestants are presented with the choice of whether to participate or not. Those who decline the offered terms are immediately expelled from SCP-024, and their re-entry is blocked by an invisible barrier. Those who choose to stay are then led further into the soundstage, to where they will participate in the actual game. The specific aesthetics and composition of the game changes with each new group of contestants, but the essence always remains the same – a long and elaborate obstacle course that must be navigated through. The precise rules also vary with some games only allowing for a single winner, while others encourage the players to work together and form teams. The obstacles can range from relatively easy and safe challenges to life-threatening tests of skill. As the contestants make their way through the unusual obstacle course, the announcer will continually talk to them, giving them updates on other contestants, advice on how to progress, adjusting rules on the fly, or even conversing with the contestant directly. As the game goes on, the obstacles become more and more deadly and difficult to overcome. This has led to the not-so-rare occurrence of there being no winners, with the entire pool of contestants having been killed or otherwise incapacitated by the various challenges. In these instances, the announcer will express his disappointment at there not being a winner, and SCP-024 appears to shut down, going dark until another group of contestants enter. Before beginning the game, the contestants are briefed on a number of rules, such as no assaulting the other contestants and no deliberate bypassing of obstacles. In the event that a rule is broken, the announcer will call out the offending contestant, and they are forcefully removed from the game by the studio guardians, who act as the physical enforcers of SCP-024's rules. The studio guardians can suddenly appear and disappear from anywhere inside SCP-024. Their exact look varies based on the theme of the obstacle course, but they always maintain a humanoid appearance, exhibit superhuman strength, and wear a mask or headgear that fully hides their face. Strangely, winners of the game have later reported that while inside the game, the studio guardians appear only as gigantic, shadowy figures that would engulf offending contestants and then disappear. 
Should one or more persons complete the obstacle course and abide by the rules that were set out by the announcer, they are declared to be the winner and the recipient of a grand prize. Prizes have included cash, electronics, cars, collectibles, and even fully paid vacations to a variety of cities and countries. The type of prize awarded seems to be completely random, and examination of the prizes collected has shown them all to be genuine, with no unusual characteristics or anomalous properties. Those who did not complete the obstacle course are announced to be losers, and the lights within SCP-024 are then switched off. The winners will find themselves outside the soundstage with their prize, while the losers are never seen or heard from again. Attempts to track where the losers go or what happens to them have all failed. GPS locator beacons placed on test groups lost their signals as soon as the game ended, and it is unknown whether this is because they were destroyed or because they were taken somewhere that blocked the signals. Perhaps the strangest aspect of SCP-024 is what happens after the game show has ended. Outside of the soundstage is a mailbox, and following the completion of a game, whether a winner was crowned or not, a VHS tape or DVD containing a recording of the entire game will appear. This is despite winners claiming to not see any cameras present while inside. Even more bizarre is the studio audience that can be seen on the recording watching the game and cheering on the contestants. Just like the cameras, winners have reported that there was no one present but the other contestants while they were inside SCP-024. The announcer also remains a mystery. During a test group which consisted solely of a Foundation researcher who conversed with the announcer, it became clear that it is both sentient and aware of events that take place in the outside world. As the researcher was the only contestant present, the announcer did not start the game and instead engaged in a conversation with the researcher. Most of the topics were centered around pop culture, and it's hypothesized that SCP-024's only means of learning about the outside world may be through television sources, though attempts to test this theory by cutting lines and removing satellite dishes from the soundstage roof have not shown to have an impact on what the announcer knows. When it became clear that the Foundation researcher would be the only contestant at that time, the announcer politely asked them to leave and recommended that they return with additional contestants at a later date. SCP-024's nature means that it can't be moved to a secure location, and it has been classified as Euclid. It has been determined that the best way to safely secure SCP-024 is to conceal its location. Five identical-looking sound stages have been built around it, and a security perimeter around the complex is maintained at all times. None of the security team members are told which is the real SCP-024, and to further prevent accidental entry, its entrance has been sealed by reinforced blast doors. Only D-Class personnel are now allowed to enter SCP-024 as test groups participating in the competition and Foundation researchers may only observe remotely. Any attempts by Foundation personnel to enter SCP-024 without prior approval from a Level 4 researcher will lead to immediate apprehension, and termination of the offender has been authorized. In the event that containment is breached, or if the true nature of SCP-024 is compromised, the entire complex is to be immediately destroyed by the specialized demolition charges that are placed throughout the containment area. A prisoner in a striped uniform is led down the central corridor of a penitentiary by a pair of guards. Wherever he's being taken, the prisoner is not going peacefully. The other inmates stand at their cell doors watching as he is dragged past them. The prisoner is begging for the guards to show him mercy, pleading for them not to make him go in there, to subject him to anything, anything in the world, but that. The guards pay no attention to his cries as they force him along. They reach the end of the corridor and stop in front of the last cell, number 667. The prisoner looks into the dark, empty cell and screams, struggling against his captors one last time before they overpower him and shove him inside, slamming the door shut behind him. The prisoner looks around the small, dim cell. All that's inside is a bed with a thin mattress and a filthy toilet. He looks extremely scared his eyes searching around the cell as if a monster is going to leap out from a dark corner and grab him. The prisoner hears a cracking sound and jumps in fright, spinning around to see a different kind of monster. Standing between the two guards who led him here is a third prison guard. He's enormous, and the prisoner watches as he cracks the knuckles of his massive hands. The giant guard reaches for something hanging next to the cell door. It's a uh, clipboard. He looks at the prisoner's uniform and notes his name before writing it down. The large guard asks over his shoulder, So, 
What are we thinking? One day? Two? For this one? One of the other guards answers. He deserves a lot more than that for what he did. Why, what'd he do? Asks the big one. He attacked one of the nurses. She's in pretty bad shape. One of the nurses? The veins in the larger guard's head start to bulge out as his grip on the pencil tightens. Who was it? It was... it was Gloria, the guard answers. The pencil snaps in the giant guard's hand. One of the guards quickly picks it up and hands it back to him. Through gritted teeth, he answers, I see. As the giant guard stares at him with angry, violent eyes, the prisoner starts to slink back into the dark cell, terrified of what's going to happen to him. You like to attack nurses, do you? Well, we're going to give you plenty of time to think about that. I'll see you in a year. The two other guards look at each other, clearly thinking that this is extreme even for a crime like this. Are you sure that's a good idea? One of them asks. But it's already too late. The guard has penciled in the date for exactly one year later. No, please no! The prisoner screams, rushing towards the bars and reaching out as if it will somehow help him. But it doesn't. There's a faint rustling of wind that seems to carry the sound of whispers, and then… the prisoner vanishes. He's simply gone blinked out of existence. The guard hangs the clipboard back on the wall before turning and quickly walking away. He needs to get to the infirmary. The two guards can do nothing but shrug at each other and follow after him. Poor guy, one of them whispers as they walk away from the empty cell. One year to the day later, the huge guard walks down the same prison corridor. It's late at night, and as he walks along, he lets his baton hit against the bars of the cells, making a loud clatter. Wake up, everyone, wake up. It's a homecoming day. Sleepy prisoners get up out of their beds and stand at the front of their cells, trying their best to look through the bars to see the cell at the end of the block. See what happens when you mess with staff? Come on, get up, get up, today's the day. It's a homecoming. The guard gets to the end of the corridor and stops in front of the empty cell with the clipboard hanging on the wall next to it. The door is open, and there's nothing inside the dark cell except for the same dirty toilet and bed. The guard takes out his pocket watch and checks the time. Everyone, the guard and the prisoners alike, are all focused on the empty cell. The guard checks his watch again. The minute hand ticks over to midnight, and the moment it does, the cell door slides shut and locks with a loud click. The prison is completely silent, each inmate waiting with bated breath to see what happens next. The guard takes out a large, heavy ring of keys and inserts one into the cell door before stepping inside. He looks around, and still it appears that nothing inside is different. But then he spots what he's looking for. There in the corner, near the toilet, is a huddled figure in a striped prison uniform. Well, 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 there you are. The guard starts to walk towards this person who has somehow appeared in the cell, but the huddled figure doesn't move or react in any way. The guard reaches down and puts a hand on the man to flip him over. How'd you enjoy your stay? Solitary confinement is one of the most brutal forms of punishment that is still in use across much of the world today. The psychological and physical distress that comes from days, weeks, months, even sometimes years spent alone can be devastating. But as horrible as this practice is, there exists a form of retribution that is even more terrifying. One that even the most hardened of criminals fear and would do anything to avoid. This is SCP-2701, also known as true solitary. SCP-2701 is a seemingly standard-looking prison cell located in a now-condemned Pennsylvania State Penitentiary. The prison, which was built in the early mid-1800s, was showing its age long before it was finally shut down, and the cell contains only an old toilet and bed, with a clipboard hanging to the left of the cell with various forms marked as intake. The cell's construction materials appear normal, and the contents themselves are non-anomalous. It is only when someone is placed inside of SCP-2701 and the clipboard next to the cell is used that its frightening effects become evident. When a human being is locked within the cell, their name is written on the intake form and a date is filled in under the Release Date section, SCP-2701's anomalous activation event is put in motion. Thirteen seconds after these conditions have been met, the person inside will disappear, completely vanishing from view as if they simply no longer exist. Any attempts to better understand the process by which they dematerialize have been unsuccessful, as all recording equipment looking into or placed inside the cell will show only static or blank images during the 13 seconds before the subject disappears. 
Researchers observing the effect in person, though, have reported the sounds of wind and unidentified whispering voices, but it is still unknown what may be producing these. At 12 o'clock a.m. on the dot, on the release date, the cell's door will somehow close and lock itself if it is not already shut. At this exact moment, the person who vanished will reappear within the locked cell. Unfortunately for the person who was locked inside, while they may have returned to our reality, it is unlikely that they will ever be the same. Experiments into SCP-2701 have revealed that those who are placed inside and vanish will experience a state of complete sensory deprivation while remaining fully conscious the entire time. They experience no sounds, smells, or sense of touching anything. They do not even see darkness, since that would imply sight. Instead, they truly experience no senses at all. This effect can be disastrous for the human psyche, with subjects reporting that they have developed intense fears of both shadows and light, claustrophobia, agoraphobia, and a fear of going to sleep following their time within SCP-2701. At the same time, they will have experienced no physical changes at all, including aging, no matter how much time has passed. But the worst part of SCP-2701 is that those who are locked inside do not experience time at the same rate as you or I. No tests have revealed that once someone disappears from within the cell, they will feel as if time has been significantly stretched out, with the dilation effect causing them to perceive time at a rate that has been estimated to be between 3 and 400 times longer than normal. That means that someone placed inside for 2 hours will experience time as if they have been locked away for 25 to 33 days, while someone placed inside for a whole year will feel as though they have been floating in a void of nothingness for several centuries. Foundation researchers have theorized that the absence of any outside stimulation for that long of a period causes the mind to break down rational thought structures in an effort to mitigate stress and that a complete psychological breakdown soon follows. In order to better understand the effects of SCP-2701, the SCP Foundation embarked on a number of tests using Class D personnel. In one experiment, which was performed on a D-class known as D-77391, the event started at 11.45 p.m and the release date was set for the coming midnight. This led to the D-Class being inside the cell for 15 minutes, though they experienced their time within as having lasted 75 to 100 hours. When D-77391 was interviewed six hours after reappearing, they described their time inside as being a true hell. Experiencing nothing but emptiness, they couldn't do anything. They couldn't sleep, they couldn't even scream. They were left alone with only their thoughts and memories. The only thing that kept them from completely losing their mind was something one of the researchers told them before they entered the cell. The researcher told them that no matter what they felt, that they had to hold on to the idea that they were going to come back. They needed to remember they wouldn't be in there forever. While these words of encouragement did seem to stave off the worst of the mental effects D-77391 could have suffered, they also impacted the results of the experiment, and the offending researcher was later reassigned to a different project, following a six-month suspension. The SCP Foundation first became aware of SCP-2701 following reports of certain abnormalities at a Pennsylvania state penitentiary. There were numerous complaints by lawyers that they were not being allowed to meet with their clients and that they were being denied access to the site by the prison's warden. When police were finally dispatched to the site to investigate, it was discovered that the entire prison, which previously housed 137 inmates and employed a number of staff, had only one inhabitant, the warden. He described the activation procedure for cell 667 and explained that he had placed every single prisoner inside one by one and made them disappear. He had been keeping the funds that were supposed to be used for the care of the inmates, as well as to bribe officials and former staff in order to keep the warden's scheme secret and prevent any official inquiries. The warden surrendered to the police without incident and an undercover foundation agent within the Philadelphia police soon alerted SCP agents to the cell's anomalous effects. When a Foundation team arrived on site, they found the cell exactly as described, along with the intake forms. The prison warden had been telling the truth. Over a hundred forms were filled out with inmates' names, with release dates ranging from 50 to over 1300 years in the future. The ease with which SCP-2701 is able to be contained has led to it receiving the safe classification. The former prison where SCP-2701 is located is monitored at all times by video and audio surveillance, and a security guard equipped with full body restraints is present at all times to both detain any subjects who appear within the cell, as well as prevent any new ones from being placed inside, that aren't a part of an official SCP Foundation experiment. 
dance fail. The young woman laughs as her date tries to catch his breath. The dancing rhythm game was much harder than he anticipated, and he can't help but also laugh at his abysmal score. He takes her hand and the two continue walking through the arcade. It's not crowded at all tonight, and the two have their choice of games as they bounce between the many pinball tables, driving games, and light gun shooters. As they finish up a game of air hockey, her date notices something. It's a door in the back of the arcade that's slightly ajar, the latch and a lock that should be keeping it closed hanging open. I wonder what's in there, he asks. Broken games? Maybe ones that let you play without putting in a token? Or keep spitting out tickets even when you lose? Come on. The two slip through the cracked door and find themselves in a dark room that doesn't look like anyone has been inside in a while. There's cobwebs and dust everywhere, but her date was right. It really is filled with broken games. He motions for her to follow as he checks out an old pinball machine. He presses the buttons, but it remains dark. He gives it a hard slap and nothing happens. How disappointing. They really are just busted old machines. The two turn to leave. They might get kicked out if anyone finds them messing around in here. They're back at the door when they both stop and look at each other. Did they hear something behind them? The young woman shrieks with fear at the sight of the old woman staring at her. This time, it's her date's turn to laugh at her. It's just an old fortune teller, nothing to be scared of. They must have accidentally turned it on. She didn't notice it before, but the machine which has the words Grandmother Predictions written across the top has come to life, and the inside is now lit up to reveal the animatronic head and torso of an old woman. The old woman isn't moving, but her glassy dead eyes seem like they are staring right at the young woman. The two look at each other, unsure of what to do, when, without warning, the old woman comes to life. With the clicking and whirring of gears, the old woman appears to breathe in deeply, opening and closing her mouth as she leans slightly forward and back inside her glass container. The young woman steps towards the fortune teller as the old woman inside keeps breathing in and out. But then suddenly, the old woman stops. There's another loud click as a card appears out of a small slot on the front of the machine. She looks down at the card, then looks back up to see that the old woman is staring at her once again, as if the robotic figure can really, truly see her. The young woman slowly reaches towards the card as the old woman's gaze stays locked on her. Her fingers touch the card, and at the exact moment she pulls it free, the fortune teller's lights go out, and the old woman slumps over. What was that? Her date asks. She didn't even notice that he is standing next to her now. He starts to search around the machine, looking for something that may have triggered it, as the young woman looks down at the card she pulled from the slot. Her face changes as she reads it, as she goes from a little freaked out to completely terrified. Hey, look at this, her date says as she quickly slips the card into her pocket. Her date reaches behind the back of the machine and pulls out a short piece of cord, one end attached to the fortune teller, the other frayed as if it had been cut. It's not even plugged in. Let's get out of here, she tells him. She doesn't need to ask him twice, and the two leave the room, emerging back into the lights and sounds of the arcade. Later that night, the two are at the door to the young woman's apartment. He asks if she's sure she's okay. She's not still scared about that broken machine, is she? It's probably just battery operated and they switched it on somehow. The young woman agrees that must be it, and that she's fine, just tired. She gives him a kiss on the cheek and bids him good night before going into her apartment and closing the door. Inside, the young woman leans against the door. She takes something out of her pocket and stares at it. It's the fortune that was dispensed from the machine. It reads, You look like you've made some mistakes. Some things are unforgivable, aren't they? No way, she thinks to herself. It's just a coincidence. The young woman walks further into her apartment and picks up a framed photo. It's a picture of her several years younger, with another girl who looks just like her. Her sister. She thinks back to that night. The night that she'll never forget no matter how hard she tries. The night she lost her, and lost part of herself, too. She sets the picture back down on the table before looking at the fortune she's still holding in her other hand. She crumples the paper in her fist and drops it in the trash before heading to bed. It's late at night, and the young woman is tossing and turning with bad dreams when she suddenly pops up awake. Did she hear a sound? She looks around her dim room, but nothing looks amiss. There it is again, though. A noise. Is it coming from the closet? She gets up out of bed and walks towards the closet, one slow step after another. She reaches towards the closet door, but the moment her fingers touch the knob, the door bursts open. She screams and falls backwards as multiple arms reach out of the darkness in the closet towards her. She screams and kicks at the arms as they grab at her, trying to pull her inside. 
She fights with all her might as she tries to crawl away from the arms. She manages to escape their grasp and stands up. She runs out of the room and towards the front door as the arms follow, reaching out of the closet, growing longer and longer, the sickening sound of bones twisting and snapping as they form new joints to bend around corners. Her hands reach out for the knob and she grabs it, just as the arms grab onto her. She's jerked backwards and falls to the floor as the arms drag her down the hallway. She tries to resist, her fingernails digging into the floorboards as the arms pull her back into the bedroom. Hello? You awake? The woman knocks loudly on the front door. Come on, we have reservations, you have to get up. The woman knocks again, but still no response. She checks her watch and with a sigh, takes out a set of keys. She finds the one she's looking for and unlocks the door. Everyone is waiting for us and I'm going to tell them we're late because of… The woman gasps as she opens the door. She can't believe what she's seeing. The apartment is a mess. It looks like a bomb went off. She looks around, but there's no sign of her daughter. Then she notices the bloody claw marks leading down the hallway towards the bedroom. She runs down the hall, stops in the doorway to the bedroom, and screams. If you've ever been to an arcade, a midway, or a boardwalk, then you may have encountered a fortune-telling machine. These small booths containing an automaton are great fun as you receive a random card that purports to tell you your future or reveal a secret truth about yourself. There's nothing to it, obviously. It's just a random card you're getting, after all. But the SCP Foundation has a fortune-telling machine in its possession that's both very real and very dangerous. SCP-517, as it is known to the Foundation, is a two-meter-tall glass and wooden fortune-telling machine that contains a mechanical animatronic facsimile of an elderly woman wearing a white blouse and a blue shawl. On top of the machine is a panel with the words, Grandmother Predictions, written on it. Once per hour, the machine will power on if an individual enters what could be considered the elderly woman's field of vision. She will turn to directly face the person, seeming to stare right at them, before dispensing a fortune card from a slot on the front of the machine, after which it will appear to shut down and cease to function. It is unknown just how the machine becomes active, seeing as the only cord coming out of the back of the machine appears to have been severed. The fortunes dispensed when the machine comes to life are less a prediction and more of a veiled threat, and examples of ones received have included, Your mother raised you better than that. I'm sorry, but fair is fair. Some people don't know how to be kind. You'll know soon enough, won't you? And people who do terrible things deserve terrible things. You've brought this upon yourself, my dear. Following an activation of SCP-517, starting at 1.43 a.m. local time, the same events will always occur. The individual that was targeted by the machine will find themselves attacked by a number of entities which have been designated as SCP-517-01. These entities are long, multi-jointed arms that emanate from a location nearby the individual. The exact number that appears will vary, but there usually seems to be between 10 and 36. The arms will appear from a single location that's often a low, cramped, and dark space like a closet, basement, or under a bed. The arms will reach out from this area and try to grab the individual before dragging them back to the location where they manifested. They appear to be able to stretch indefinitely, growing as long as they need in order to continue pursuing the individual, and their many joints allow them to bend around corners or any other obstacles. Should the individual manage to fight the arms off or escape, new arms will materialize nearby the victim to aid in the capture. Once the arms have subdued the targeted person and gotten them back to the area where they appeared, they will begin savagely assaulting them, beating and clawing at them until nothing remains of the victim but a bloody pile of flesh and bones. To date, the Foundation is not aware of any targeted individuals surviving an attack by SCP-517-01 entities. In the event that the fortune-telling machine was activated multiple times on the same day, multiple instances of arms appearing will occur at different locations at the same time, with each group hunting their own individual target. Efforts have been made to figure out exactly where the arms manifest from, and during testing, cameras were set up around the targeted individual in order to try and locate a place of origin. Unfortunately, the arms somehow seemed aware that they were being watched, and the arms always emanated from around a corner or other place that was out of the field of view of the cameras. Tests on SCP-517 did reveal one piece of evidence, though, as fragments of DNA were recovered from the areas where SCP-517-01 instances appeared. DNA that turned out to be human in origin. The origins of the DNA and the identity of the owner have yet to be determined. Research and containment of SCP-517 has proven to be quite difficult, as evidenced by an event designated Incident 517-1997-M. 
As Foundation agent Dr. Mayle supervised the transport of SCP-517 to a new containment storage locker, the fortune teller suddenly activated and it was suspected that Dr. Mayle had become a target. Security personnel were alerted, and a defensive strategy was devised to protect her from instances of SCP-517-01 that were expected to manifest that night at 1.43 a.m. Dr. Mail was taken to a helicopter on the roof of a Foundation cafeteria and given the protection of multiple security personnel as they waited for the arms to manifest. Right on cue, the arms appeared in a storage area inside the cafeteria and began stretching their way towards the roof. Security teams inside the cafeteria opened fire on the arms, which took damage just like normal human arms, though they would quickly be replaced by more. More instances of SCP-517-01 began appearing, coming out from under parked vehicles and other storage areas, as the number of arms coming out of the original manifestation site continued to increase, until there were over a hundred. The arms did not seem to want to fight back against the security teams, though. They seemed singular in their focus, to get to the roof where Dr. Mail was waiting. As the ever-increasing amount of limbs overwhelmed the security teams and breached the roof, the order was given for the helicopter to take off. The helicopter rose into the air, but the arms began manifesting from somewhere underneath the helicopter itself. The arms broke through the windows and pulled Dr. Mail out, passing her down to the waiting arms on the roof that then carried her through the cafeteria's ventilation system. A security personnel in the cafeteria attempted to sever the limbs with a knife and rescue Dr. Mail, but the arms are no longer ignoring their attackers and grabbed him as well dragging him down towards the storage locker along with the doctor. In the end, four members of the security team along with Dr. Mail were pulled into the storage area by the arms. Their remains were collected the next morning, and the Foundation made their best efforts to separate and identify what was left for individual funerary services. SCP-517, which has been classified as safe, is kept in a dedicated containment cell at all times facing away from the doorway, with an opaque black sheet bound around it. Following the events of Incident 517-1997-M, all testing has been halted, without the express written permission of the site director. Peering into our future can be a fun activity, even when we know it's all just a bit of make-believe. When you pull your fortune from a booth containing an elderly automaton, though, you might just find that this time, Grammy knows your fate for real. Three SCP Foundation agents stand before a large warehouse. Their mission is simple. Enter the building, find the observation unit that has gone missing inside, recover the data from it, and leave. It should be easy, but the rundown structure they're standing in front of is no ordinary building. This is SCP-015. The leader of the group, a large muscled man who goes by the codename of Agent 6, slides open a large door on the front of the warehouse, and immediately the whole group is struck by a sight that makes them reconsider just how easy this mission is going to be. In front of them is not a wide open warehouse floor, but a cramped tunnel leading deeper into the building. The group has a job to do though, and so the three head inside, Agent 2 first, followed by Agent Lon, the data specialist, and finally, Agent 6, the expedition leader in the rear. As they enter the narrow hall of pipes, the light from their flashlights plays off the floor, walls, and ceiling. Flashlights are one of the only items allowed in SCP-015 and they reveal what the researchers had told them in their briefing, that many of the pipes aren't made of standard materials, but instead are all sorts of strange substances like wood, glass, or even bone. The odd series of pipes have formed a twisting tunnel leading deeper into the warehouse. The group must be careful, since the floor is uneven, with pipes occasionally sticking up out of the floor like tree roots, ready to trip the unobservant. The three follow the corridors of pipes along the path that they each had to memorize. As they come to branching paths, Agent 2 speaks the series of turns they must take aloud. Left, left, right, left, right, right again, straight, right. And so on as they go deeper and deeper. They'd have to follow the directions exactly if they hoped to reach the place where the modular robotic vehicle should be. Left, straight, straight again, right, just a couple more turns and they'd reach the point where the MRV had sent its last signal before going offline. As they walk, though, they find that some of the passageways are getting more difficult to pass. The pipes have closed in at certain points, choking the already small tunnels down to mere crawlways. At one particularly narrow point, the group must get down on their bellies and pull themselves along the ground. After Lon and Two exit the tight passage, Agent Six suddenly calls out to the two agents ahead of him. What is it? What's wrong? Two asks. I'm stuck. 
comes the response from Six. Lon and Two grab Six's arms and begin pulling. With a loud grunt from all of them, Six finally comes free. His pant leg is shredded from the thorny wood that one of the pipes in the narrow tunnel is made from, but he's free, and they can continue on. Finally, after what seemed like an hour of walking, they finally find it. The modular robotic vehicle that had been sent in to investigate the current state of SCP-015. There's something very strange about the robot's condition, though. It looks like it has been speared right through its primary observation unit. A smooth black pipe that appeared to be made of dark fabric had pierced the vehicle right through its camera, but the lens didn't appear broken. Instead, it looked as if the pipe had somehow connected with it, docking inside the lens housing as if the two parts were made for each other. Other pipes had protruded from the floors and walls as well, snaking into open spots on the vehicle and lifting it up a foot off the ground. They looked over the robot, which was held helpless in the air, its wheels slowly spinning as its internal battery ran down. The agents walked around the MRV, examining it, looking confused about the fate that had befallen it. Six suddenly broke the silence. Well, what are you waiting for? Lon wasn't sure what to do, though. As she got closer to the robot, she noticed that a foul-smelling substance was dripping from the pipe that had merged with the camera. Her job was to remove the data from the MRV, but they also had strict orders not to damage anything in SCP-015. So what was she to do about the robot? Wasn't it technically a part of SCP-015 now? She was worried that if she removed the data cards, then SCP-015 might… well, she didn't know exactly. Six didn't buy it, though. The researchers may have told them that 015 reacts, but he could see now that it's just a bunch of weird pipes. Maybe it grows or moves a bit, but how would it even know they were there? It hadn't shown any signs of sentience, let alone sapience. He wasn't going to hang around in here any longer than he had to, though, and if Lon wouldn't get on with it, then he would. Six moves to the MRV and flips open the data cover on its side. More of the fetid liquid pours out, but he ignores it. Lon and Two both look at each other. Did the other hear that too? It sounded like steam venting from somewhere deep inside SCP-015. Six doesn't seem to have heard it, and begins to remove the thin data cards from the MRV. With the data now recovered, he decides to see if he could free the vehicle from the pipes. It wasn't necessarily a mission objective, but why let good foundation property go to waste when it's right here in front of them? Six pulls first at the MRV, then the pipes that were running into it, but he can't get it to move. It's completely stuck, seemingly fused to the pipes. Come on, we've got the data, let's get out of here, Two says. But Six isn't done trying. He sets his flashlight down and uses both hands, pushing against the wall of pipes with his foot to gain additional leverage when suddenly, there's a creaking sound. Ha! I think I got it! But Six was mistaken. It wasn't the sound of the MRV coming free that he had heard, but the sound of the floor underneath him giving way. Six falls into the floor up to his armpits, and the other two agents rush to help him. But as they do, they notice the glow and immediate burst of heat coming from the hole. Thickly flowing molten glass begins to fill the hole, and Agent Six cries for help as they desperately try to pull him free. His cries turn into screams of desperation as they each grab an arm and, after a struggle, finally manage to free him and drag him from the hole. Six is no longer screaming as he is pulled free, though. His eyes and mouth are locked wide in sheer panic. Lon is now the one who starts to scream, as she realizes that they have pulled only the top half of Agent Six from the hole above the fiery pit. The bottom half of his body is completely gone, burned away by the heat of the liquid glass. There's no time to be shocked, though because pipes begin to hiss and ping all around them. A wooden pipe above Two and Lon suddenly bursts, sending a cloud of dust flying into their faces. It's powdered glass, and it starts to pour out of the broken pipe, covering what's left of Six completely. Two spits out a thick stream of blood, his mouth shredded from the glass particles, as Lon desperately tries not to rub them deeper into the cuts in her eyes. They both know they can't stay here, though. They have to run. The pipes are deafening as they move as quickly as they can back the way they came. It sounds like a train is barreling through the building. They're surrounded by chaos. Boiling chemicals pour out of one pipe. Tiny slicing rose thorns spray out of another. They come to a crawlway that's just a couple feet wide, but it's their only way forward, and they have no choice but to enter. Two dives in and starts crawling. Lon is hesitant, but a blast of steam from a pipe near her head convinces her she has no choice, and she follows after him. Two wriggles through the narrow passage and is surrounded by more sounds of pipes creaking all around him. 
Each one seems like it might burst and pour who knows what deadly substance onto him. But he has to suppress his fear and keep moving forward. Finally, he emerges into a wider hallway. He turns and looks back at the hole. Lon should have been right behind him, but there's no sign of her. He sticks his head back in and calls for her. There's no response, but he can hear her still in there, somewhere in the dark, struggling. He has to help her. Two gets back into the passage and starts crawling. She couldn't have been that far behind him, probably just around the next turn. But as he crawls around the bend, there's nothing there, just another wall of pipes. The passage has been sealed up. It's a dead end. He presses his ear to the wall and can hear Lon screaming on the other side. He hits his flashlight against the pipes in anger. The pipe shakes for a moment, then bursts, spraying out a black liquid that covers his hand. It's some kind of corrosive acid, and he screams as it burns through his gloves to the flesh beneath. He quickly crawls backwards out of the narrow tunnel and emerges back out into the wider passage. Chu cradles his hand, trying not to look at the exposed bone. I'm sorry, he cries as he runs through the tunnel of pipes towards what he hopes is the exit. I'll get help. I'll come back, I swear. Lon can't hear his promises, though. She heard what she thought was a pipe burst followed by Tu's cries, but she doesn't know now if he's dead or alive. She decides she has no choice but to go back the way she came. Maybe there's another way out. But after moving just a few inches, her feet touch a solid wall. She's trapped in a space no bigger than a coffin. She feels around, but there's nothing here in the dark. Nothing at all. Just smooth, fuzzy, warm pipes. No way. There is something. A gap in the ceiling. But it's just the open end of another pipe. And now, there's something dripping out of it. Droplets of whatever the substance is land on her face, and then a full stream of liquid pours out onto her. She coughs as it gets into her mouth, but then realizes that it's sweet. It's honey? At least it wasn't molten glass or deadly acid. Maybe she could even survive for a time on the liquid until another expedition team came to rescue her. Her brief moment of hope is cut short when she realizes that the pipe isn't stopping and that she's already lying in an inch-deep pool of honey. Lon beats on the walls and ceiling as the honey continues to rise around her and screams for help. She tries to plug the pipe with her fingers, but it's no use. Nothing can stop more and more of it from pouring out. The honey continues to rise around her, and all she can do is scream and claw at the pipes that have created her tomb. She presses her lips to the ceiling in an attempt to gain one last breath before the honey completely fills the space. Her final choking gasps are sickly and sweet as the honey fills her lungs. Agent 2 keeps running through the tunnel of pipes. His hand no longer hurts, at least, either from the shock or from the fact that all the nerve endings had been burned away. The horrible sounds coming from the pipes seem to have stopped, too. Maybe he really would make it out of this alive. Lon might have found another way out, too. There's no telling how many routes through this maze of pipes exist. He would probably exit the building to find her outside waiting for him. Poor Agent 6, though. He never had a chance after opening that cover on the MRV. His thoughts are abruptly interrupted, though, when his foot catches on an unseen pipe and he falls forward onto the floor. Or rather, he should have fallen on the floor. Instead, a pit opens up in the ground, leading to a steep, sloping floor of pipes. He screams and tries to stop himself, but the slick liquid covering everything makes it impossible for him to slow his descent, and he begins to slide down the pipes. His dimming flashlight shows what seemed to be an endless tunnel of pipes stretching down into the dark. The tube of pipes twisted this way and that, slamming him into the walls on either side, tumbling him head over feet. And the descent never seemed to end. He screamed until his voice went hoarse, then gave out entirely. He didn't have any way to mark the passage of time other than when his flashlight finally started to flicker and then dim before finally dying. He slid down the endless tunnel of pipes for what felt like days in the darkness, far deeper than they physically should have been able to go. When the friction of the pipes began to tear his skin away, it was almost welcome. At least there would finally be an end. Following the loss of the SCP-015 recovery team, the data on the modular robotic vehicle was deemed non-vital and no further expeditions were authorized in order to try and recover it. SCP-015 is a mass of pipes, vents, boilers, and other various plumbing apparatuses that have completely filled an otherwise nondescript warehouse located in a major American city. Anytime the warehouse is not being directly observed, the pipes will begin to grow, filling nearly all of the available space in the building, but also trying to connect to other nearby structures through the sewer and other subterranean infrastructure systems. The current best estimate of Foundation researchers is that the building contains over 190 kilometers of pipes, 
which range from just 2.5 centimeters to over 1 meter in diameter. While some of these pipes will look new, others have the appearance of being rusted or damaged, with many showing signs of leaking. The pipes are made of a strange assortment of materials as well, including bone, wood, steel, pressed ash, human flesh, glass, and granite. Oddly, no pipes composed of lead, PVC plastic, copper, or any other material one would normally expect to be used for the production of pipes have been found. But by far the strangest anomalous quality of SCP-015 is that it appears to react to aggressors. Should the building detect that the personnel inside of it are carrying tools, or if they make any attempt to either damage or repair any of its pipes, they will trigger an immediate reaction. Pipes near the offending subject will often burst, spraying them with a variety of liquids that have included oil, mercury, rats, a species of insect not yet identified, ground glass, seawater, entrails, and molten iron. More and more pipes will continue to burst around the subject until they either retreat from SCP-015 or are killed. SCP-015 was discovered by the Foundation after reports that pipes emanating from a warehouse had mysteriously started to connect to multiple other nearby structures, with no obvious answer for how or why they had suddenly begun emerging from the structure. The pipes were eventually able to be cut back and are now solely within the warehouse once again, but the human cost of containing SCP-015 has been high, and so far, 11 SCP personnel have been killed in their interactions with the anomaly and an additional 20 are still missing. All of the missing are presumed to also be dead, though there have been reports of banging and screaming coming from within the building that may indicate they are still alive in some form. SCP-015 has been classified as Euclid, and because the building itself is impossible to move, it has been effectively contained on site. The Foundation maintains a gap of at least 2 meters around the warehouse, and no structures are allowed to be built that make contact with the building's outer walls. Should any protrusions from SCP-015 be detected, the pipes are to be immediately capped and sealed. Internal exploration of SCP-015 is permitted with approval from senior staff, but following numerous losses within the site, expedition teams must consist of three members, all of whom are equipped with safety lines and GPS tracking. The teams are not allowed to bring any hand or power tools within the building, nor are they to attempt any repairs or maintenance of any kind while inside. There's no need to enforce these rules, though, seeing as SCP-015 appears more than happy to terminate the offenders itself. The SCP Foundation contains many anomalous locations, though SCP-015 may just be one of the strangest. It's the grisliest crime scene the detective has seen in years. Photographers wince as they capture it all in a succession of quick, stark flashes. CSI technicians do what they can to pick up the broken pieces. Posted at the gate, a rookie doubles over and throws up, while his older partner gives him a sympathetic pat on the back. He can't hide his own discomfort at the things they've seen today. The call came in the middle of the night from a pair of concerned hikers on the outskirts of town. They were halfway through their nightly walk down an old country road when they heard screaming from a nearby farm. When officers finally made their way down to the farmhouse, it was too late. Everyone there was dead. Nobody to save. All that's left to do is pick up the pieces and figure out what the hell actually happened. The detective leans under a yellow garland of crime scene tape and asks an attending officer what they know so far. The cop, who looks pale and clammy, swallows over a lump in his throat and says, Looks like the old farmer snapped and went postal. Whole family's dead. We found his body in the barn. He heads inside to take a look at the carnage. It's a veritable house of horrors. The farmer's wife is dead in the kitchen. The children were both murdered in their beds. The detective can't say he's ever seen a murder done in such cold blood, so detached. For a man with no history of violence to do something so terrible to his loved ones for no reason. The detective shakes his head and walks upstairs, sliding on rubber gloves to avoid contaminating the scene. He goes room to room, making fastidious notes about anything suspicious. He's got a keen eye for this kind of thing. The man's a 20-year veteran of the force, he's seen some terrible things. But as he lays his eyes on the bodies of the victims, he can't help but feel a chill tiptoeing down his vertebrae. In the master bedroom, where the now deceased farmer and his wife once shared a loving marital bed, he hits some pay dirt, a diary in the bedside cabinet. He flips through. Early on, it's all mundane, scattered thoughts for the day at hand and little to-do lists for the next one. But the last three entries contain a marked shift from what came before. The first one reads, he seemed shook up when he came back from the barn today. 
He's awful quiet about it. Said something like, I heard something I shouldn't have. In the barn? Don't know what that could mean, but I decided not to press. Stressed enough already. He didn't say much to the kids during dinner. Kept looking over his shoulder. Freaked me out something terrible. I don't know what did it, but whatever it was, he put a scare in him. The second reads, I'm starting to worry about him. It's been a few days since whatever he heard in the barn, and he ain't gotten any better. In fact, I think he's getting worse. He won't shower. Something about the bathroom mirror, he just won't go in there. He hasn't been eaten. Worst of all, he doesn't sleep. I'll wake up in the middle of the night and see him sitting bolt upright, staring at the bedroom door, not saying a word, not even blinking. The third and final entry reads, This ain't the man I married anymore. There's something wrong with him. It's scaring the kids and it's scaring me. He started bringing his gun to bed every night. Doesn't sleep, just sits there with it. He never sleeps. When I asked him what's happening, he told me something's coming, but it's okay. He won't let it get us no matter what. I don't understand. I'm gonna take the kids and go stay with mom for a few weeks while he works this out. But I'm afraid of what he'll do if he realizes. The gun is always loaded. The detective sighs and slides the diary into an evidence baggie. It was, sadly, a tale he'd heard all too many times. The terrible things we can do to the ones we love when we're not ourselves. Though it now seems cut and dry, a mental break snowballing into a massacre, one detail is still gnawing at the detective. What did the farmer hear in the barn that day? When the detective enters, he orders everyone else to leave. He needs some time alone in here. As the people file out, he approaches the farmer's corpse. He's laying in the straw, head a bloody mess, bludgeoned beyond recognition. And yet, he's the one holding the bloodstained hammer. And in his other hand, he's clutching something even stranger, a rusty old cowbell. Of all the things to be holding in your last moments on Earth, the detective thinks as he reaches over. Something about the bell draws his eye. Why, after murdering his entire family, would a man head out into the barn and, presumably, try and fail to hammer a cowbell to pieces? As he picks up the bell, he runs his gloved fingers along the rust. Other than the wear and tear of age, the bell shows no signs of actual damage. It's such a strange, innocuous object. What's the significance? His internal musing is interrupted when a large spider, the kind that like to make their homes in straw-filled barns, suddenly crawls out from inside the bell and onto the detective's hand. He drops the bell, an involuntary shock reflex, and it hits the ground with a brassy gong. The sound lingers in the air for far longer than it should. It seems almost like it's getting louder. The detective feels his heartbeat speeding up, his breaths getting heavy and labored. The sound gets louder feels like someone is sitting on his chest. He falls to his knees, scratching at his swelling throat. His heart pounds. Is he having a heart attack? He claws at the dirt and straw beneath him, trying desperately to get a handle on things as the world around him seems to go dark. The toll of the cowbell gets louder and louder. Eventually, he's able to force out a scream, then collapses to the ground. When his eyes open, he's being carted away on a stretcher to a nearby ambulance, parked just outside the crime scene. When a paramedic asks him if he's okay, the only thing he can stutter out through his dry mouth is, Don't touch the bell. Don't let anyone touch the bell. The doctor who treats him will later tell him there are no signs of any physical ailment. In all likelihood, the detective had experienced a severe anxiety attack. When the detective tells the doctor that he has no history of anxiety attacks and that this is far from the first violent crime scene he's encountered, the doctor purses his lips and knits his brow in concentration. Very strange, the doctor says. Perhaps just take it easy for the next few days. Work stress can sneak up on a person, especially in a career as high stakes as yours. It can sometimes manifest in rather strange ways. That night, the detective is at home, brewing himself a soothing cup of herbal tea on his doctor's recommendation. He's still racked by a strange uneasiness from earlier in the day. You see, one of the keys to being a good detective is pattern recognition. You're able to detect obscure links between pieces of information that other people, in the stress of the moment, may not correlate. As the detective sips his tea, he remembers the first entry in the farmer's wife's diary. When the farmer's downward spiral started, it began with him hearing something he shouldn't have inside the barn. The detective doesn't know a lot about what happened to himself in that barn either, but he can safely say he heard something he shouldn't have heard too. He sighs, no point in psyching himself out like this. 
After all, it's just the post-attack jitters, and turns to his kitchen window, hoping to look out at the night sky and feel a little more at peace. Instead, he sees something out of a nightmare. A tall figure standing behind him, somewhere in the ballpark of human, but also somehow not. It's tall, fleshy, and emaciated. Its face is too smooth, with bulging eyes and a large mouth being the only features. It reaches for him with huge, spindle-fingered hands mere centimeters away from the back of his head. But the second it sees him looking at it, it turns and begins to run. The detective's mug falls and shatters on the ground. He turns with an involuntary yelp to track the creature, but it's already gone. His kitchen is empty and silent. Of course, one question haunts his mind. What the hell just happened? He's no fool. He knows the mind can play funny tricks on you. After all, who hasn't seen something out of the corner of their eye that gave them a momentary fright before realizing that it was just a trick of the imagination? But this wasn't just a flicker playing on a paranoid mind. The detective would swear on his mother's life that he truly saw this thing, some bizarre humanoid monster standing behind him in his reflection. He doesn't know which possibility scares him more, that there really was something behind him, or that he's starting to lose his mind. Either offered a number of frightening possibilities, but the detective does what he does best, applies logic to a situation. He'd spent the day around a particularly distressing crime scene, read something unnerving in the diary of one of the victims, and suffered a panic attack in the barn. All of this was just a suggestion implanted in his mind, connections being threaded where they shouldn't, a natural side effect of a brain wired to register patterns in strange data clusters. The detective does his best to remain calm for the rest of the evening. Fear is the mind killer. Panic only ever makes a situation worse. These are both things he believes, but he can't seem to shake that creeping feeling of dread. He's being watched. For the first time in his adult life, the detective decides he doesn't want to sleep in the dark. All those shapes in the blackness put him on edge. He thinks that a good night's sleep will probably have him right as rain by tomorrow morning. Everything passes eventually. As his mind drifts and his eyes begin to flutter closed, he starts to wonder if he always left that bathroom door open, or whether it started to open very slowly as soon as his head hit the pillow. Sure enough, he wakes up gasping. Long, cold fingers, abnormally long in fact and cold as death, have closed around his throat. He's gasping in vain for breath as the hand clamps tighter. His eyes jolt open and he sees it again, that tall, thin monster lingering over him, strangling him. Its face is split into a wide, sadistic, tooth-bearing grin, or something so thin it's impossibly strong. The detective can't move, he can't scream, he can't do anything. But as he slips from sleep to true wakefulness, the monster is gone. It wafts out of the room with all the ease of a gust of wind. He sits up, heart pounding, lungs strained, skin slick with sweat. He's never been so afraid in his life. He's been calmer during the active shootouts of his beat days all those years ago. The thing that was strangling him, it looked exactly the same as the monster from the reflection. They weren't just similar, it was exactly the same thing. Is he being stalked? Then it dawns on him, another fragment of information swimming in the mess of his consciousness. An article he'd read a couple years before about a phenomenon known as sleep paralysis. It's when people suddenly wake up during REM sleep. Their body remains paralyzed while their consciousness activates, giving them one foot in reality while leaving the other in a nightmare. In this state, people can believe they're being attacked by monsters or demons. And one of the major factors causing sleep paralysis? Stress. The detective sighs. He feels like an idiot. There's nothing he's experienced today that doesn't have a completely logical explanation. So why does he keep jumping to such absurd conclusions? Twisting facts to suit theories rather than theories to suit facts. That being said, he still doesn't sleep another wink that night. He pours himself a few cups of coffee, subconsciously avoiding anything reflective, and sits in bed until sunrise, just watching his bedroom door. Better safe than sorry, he keeps repeating in the empty corridors of his addled brain. He drives to work the next morning like he always does. Sitting at a stoplight, a car pulls up next to him, and he catches something in the reflection of the car's window. It's that monster again, sitting next to him, reaching out towards him with one of its huge hands. The detective gasps and spins around, his eyes flaring with panic. But of course, it isn't there. Just some children on the sidewalk on their way to school. Maybe it's the fear, maybe it's the sleep deprivation, maybe it's both. But in that moment, he feels like crying. Little does he know, things are going to get so much worse. Over the following days, the frequency of the sightings increases. 
Any time he finds his eyes meeting a reflective surface, that monster is there, approaching him. But of course, it runs away before he can ever look at it head on. The people at work keep giving him funny looks. He grits his teeth. He can't say anything. If he tells anyone what's been happening to him, they'll haul him off to the funny farm to spend the rest of his life in a padded cell. But he knows he's not crazy. It's too real to be the product of human insanity. This isn't some hallucination. That thing is really there. It's always waiting, always watching. Even when he can't see it, he can feel its eyes on him, sense its malicious intent. It's even worse at night. Every time he tries to sleep, it attacks him. He feels its hand clasping around his throat. He feels its bald fists pummeling his body. He feels its long fingernails scratching into his skin. He can't sleep anymore. He's too scared. And that too takes its toll. Every feeling, every emotion, every thought starts to take on an odd, flat quality, like nothing is quite real. He starts to subsist on coffee, energy drinks, and anything else that will give him a buzz of alertness. He started to carry his service pistol around with him everywhere. He hides it under his pillow at night. He can never be too careful. He knows that the creature is always out there, always watching, always waiting. He knows on some level that it won't stop until it has taken everything from him. He's taking the subway to work again. He's messy, disoriented. His clothes stink. His bloodshot eyes are couched in unsightly bags. He shivers slightly, a nervous twitch. Put simply, he's not the man he used to be. He can't drive anymore. His nerves are too wrecked, and he has to take the bus to and from work. That's when he sees it, not behind him this time, but on the other side of the street as he waits for his bus. It stands among the other pedestrians, all seemingly oblivious to its presence. It just smiles, mocking him. This time, the detective is ready. The detective won't have it. In a single fluid motion, he unholsters his pistol and begins firing at the creature. The street erupts into screams as people scatter to avoid the frantic volley of gunshots, but the creature doesn't move. It just keeps grinning as the detective fires, the rage and sleep deprivation throwing off his aim. He hears the sound of the bell again, its toll rising, its deafening. He needs to kill it. He needs to get closer. The detective walks toward the creature, firing bullet after bullet. The creature doesn't care. He roars in animal fury. The bell toll rises. A sudden light illuminates the creature's terrible smile, as the detective realizes that the sound he's hearing isn't the toll of the bell at all. He turns just in time to see the bus, but not in enough time to get out of the way. The cowbell the detective found in the barn that day seemed innocuous enough, but this old cowbell corroded and covered in rust, which no known methods, chemical or mechanical, seemed to be able to remove, would soon have a name, SCP-513. It was discovered by an SCP Foundation agent during containment reestablished procedure MU at a classified containment site, where its interior was covered in duct tape to prevent it from properly making a sound. There was also a paper note attached, reading, You've seen it. Now he can hear you. You've touched it. Now he can see you. Never ring it. If you hear it, he can touch you. And this is a warning worth heeding, because ringing SCP-513 invariably results in death. The question is just how much mental and physical anguish it puts its victim through before that endpoint. When the bell is first rung, anyone within earshot will begin to experience extreme anxiety, including physical symptoms such as heightened heart rate and raised blood pressure. They will also report feelings of dread and may claim that they can feel themselves being watched. Within about an hour, this worry is confirmed. SCP-513-1 is the less than charming creature hounding the unfortunate bell ringer and will begin to stalk the affected individuals. It will appear to approach individuals from behind, but quickly disappear if ever the subject attempts direct visual contact. It will also stage non-lethal physical attacks on its victims during their sleep in order to induce greater levels of psychological terror, though it disappears quickly upon waking. The stalking threat will only elevate over time, leading to increased psychological disarray for the victim. SCP-513-1 will eventually induce paranoia, aggression, hypervigilance, and depression, ending in a distressing and violent death. Because of the immense danger posed to anyone who hears the sound of this cowbell tolling, SCP-513 has been given extensive containment precautions, extensive enough to warrant giving it the Euclid Containment Class, a classification reserved for things that are often unpredictable in containment. SCP-513 is suspended in a one cubic meter block of gelatin and contained within a soundproofed, climate-controlled cell. The gelatin is inspected daily for any degradation or loss of integrity. 
An emergency inspection is carried out immediately following any earthquake, explosion, or sonic event grade 2 or higher. Personnel performing the inspection wear earplugs and active noise-canceling earmuffs at all times while inside SCP-513's cell to avoid any kind of accidental exposure. If the gelatin cube shows any signs of degradation, such as rips, tears, splits, liquefaction, or mold, SCP-513 will be immediately removed and suspended within a replacement cube by a team of surgically deafened Class D personnel. No other personnel are to enter the cell during this procedure. Any sentient beings exposed to SCP-513 are to be monitored by at least two security personnel at all times. Under absolutely no circumstances may exposure victims be administered sedatives or allowed to fall unconscious. Any victim who does fall unconscious is to be terminated immediately. Class D personnel are to be terminated at the first sign of mental degradation. All other exposure victims may be terminated at their request. If possible, SCP-513-1 is to be apprehended on site, but sadly, the Foundation hasn't managed to get their hands on this unpleasant creature yet. But be careful ringing any mysterious old bells you find, or else he might just get his hands on you. It all started with the roses dying. Only the one bush at first. The old man had come out to water his garden the same way he did every morning. It was looking sad and brown, leaves drooping and branches hardening. Just the one bush in the corner. But the next day, the bushes on either side of it had died too. Within a week, it was that whole corner of the garden. As the old man puts on his gardening gloves at the sink and stares out of the kitchen window, he knows that something is seriously wrong with his poor plants. The flourishing garden, so neatly maintained throughout all of his retirement years, his pride and joy, is now steadily dying before his very eyes. Living in a small one-story house, there isn't much left for him to do. Out in Bushy, right on the edge of what could be considered London, there is very little going on with his day. Inside the house, he hangs all of his photos of the Lancaster bomber that he and his squad flew in the Second World War. Although those days are long behind him now, he chose to live here because on the hill that his house is on, he can see the planes taking off and landing from the nearby RAF base. And where does he like to sit and watch the planes? From his immaculate garden. The old man scowls at it. The perfectly trimmed hedges, blossoming trees, uniform grass, and colorful beds are all being ruined by a dark stain steadily spreading from the back right corner. Starting with that rosebush in the corner and spreading out, everything in a rough circle measuring close to 15 feet is withering away and dying. Not on his watch. The kettle finishes boiling. He has to use his old gas hobs to heat up the water. The cooker is apparently long past its lifespan. The ignition stopped working years ago, so he has to use matches to start it. If he leaves on the gas by accident, well, there wouldn't be much of a kitchen left. He pours the water out into a mug and starts brewing his morning cup of tea. A few minutes later, the back door slides open and the old man emerges, trowel and cup of tea in hand. Years ago, he would have marched purposefully across the grass, but now he is forced to plod instead. His knees and back are both starting to give out from the years of tending to his precious green friends, but the fire is still in his belly. He reaches the edge of the dead patch and looks down. The lawn isn't just yellowing, it's fully brown. He pokes at the grass with his shoe and it breaks apart to the touch. How strange, he's never seen anything die off so suddenly and uniformly. It isn't just a bad bed or an infection spreading around, it's a clear patch of death where nothing in the given area stands a chance. He steps onto the brown grass and walks to the corner where that first rosebush died. The base of the fence is rotting away in that corner, giving him a peek into his neighbor's garden. With a good deal of groaning and aching, the old man lowers himself onto his hands and knees and peers under the fence. A pair of eyes meet his. The old man yells out in surprise. The person on the other end screams. After a moment, they look under again and start laughing. It's just the mom from next door. She has kids who like to play in the garden on their trampoline while he's working. They'll often talk over the fence to him between bounces. I hope I didn't give you a heart attack, she teases. He reassures her that he's made of sterner stuff than that. Then they got to the matter at hand. What is going on in their gardens? She's having the same issue too. That same circle is spreading out over her side too. Everything it touches is dying. Well then, has to be coming from this corner, the old man says. A pair of them pull the fence apart around the corner, creating a little hole between their gardens. It's short work. The boards break apart at the lightest touch. Before long, they have a little worksite ready. 
There must be something down in this corner that's causing all of this. Side by side, the old man and the mom from next door start to dig. The soil feels strange to dig through. There's a kind of stickiness to it, as if there's a very faint layer of slime binding it together. Could it be a dead animal? That's the old man's best guess right now, but it doesn't seem very convincing. Surely that would nourish the soil with more nutrients. It might offset the pH balance a bit, but not to the extent of… Crack! The mom's trowel breaks. She holds it up to her face, confused. The metal shovel scoop has broken. The tip of it has fallen off, half snapped, half melted. I just bought this the other day. But the old man isn't looking at the trowel anymore. Instead, he's staring into the hole that the pair of them have dug. Down there at the bottom, underneath the piece of broken metal, something is moving. He plants a gloved hand on either side of the hole and leans down over it, peering at whatever it is. Worms, tiny brown worms, each writhing and wrapping around the others, tying and untying knots. He straightens up with a groan, takes his gloves off, and pushes himself to his feet. We need to call the council. There's something dead down there that's rotten badly. The woman from Hertzmere Council was clearly not very interested in sending a waste disposal team down when the old man called her. She told him they would stop by the bungalow in three to five working days and hung up. Several calls later, she relented and agreed they would send a team across that afternoon. Soon after 4 p.m., a knock comes at the door. The old man escorts the waste disposal team around the side entrance, keen for them not to traipse any mud through the house. Clearly annoyed by this, the two workmen for the council trudge around the side and out into the garden, grumbling about how they have more important things to be getting on with. The old man chooses to ignore them, leading them to the back corner of his garden and pointing down into the hole he and his neighbor had dug just that morning. Only, the hole is empty. What are we looking at here? One of the workmen grunts. It's a good question. There's nothing at the bottom of the hole, no writhing worms, not even the shard of the trowel. It's just an empty hole. The old man kneels back down by the hole and scoops back the dirt of it with his own trowel. Nothing. The old man hears words muttered that he hasn't heard since the war as he escorts the two gentlemen back to their van. They slam the doors more heavily than necessary and drive off down the quiet suburban street, leaving the man standing confused on his doorstep. The next day when he goes out to garden, the circle of death hasn't grown. It still looks bad. The plants inside it are clearly dead, but it hasn't spread any further than it was the previous day. The old man sips his tea over the sink and stares out at the garden. It must have been next door. That would be it. Before the council had shown up yesterday, the mom must have come outside and bagged up whatever dead thing was back there and thrown it out herself. Good. He just hopes it doesn't stink up the bin. Now to do the sad part of the task and clear away all of his dead plants. Those rose bushes had been planted the year he moved in. His wife had planted them. As he dons his gloves, the old man feels a wave of sadness wash over but before he can experience it too deeply, he notices the holes. The tips of his gloves are gone, his fingers poking clean out. In fact, looking down at his trousers, he notices a pair of holes on the knees of them from where he'd been kneeling in the dirt yesterday. A knock at the front door makes him jump. He goes out to see the mom from next door standing anxiously outside his place. She's glancing up and down the street as she talks. She asks if he's seen either of her boys. He shakes his head, hasn't seen them all day. He reassures her it's probably nothing. Back in his day, boys used to go out of the house first thing in the morning and be back for dinner. Parents these days are too sensitive, too anxious. The look on her face tells him that he isn't helping. She mutters something about having seen someone suspicious walking down the street, someone strange. No use worrying about it for now. She heads off in the direction of the local park to go and look for her sons. The old man calls out to her as she leaves, thanking her for sorting out the dead animal from the end of the garden. She looks back at him confused. She hadn't touched it. All the rest of the day, the old man stands by his curtains, twitching them open every now and then to peer out and see if the boys are anywhere to be seen. He's locked all of his doors and left the keys under his pillow, but sunset comes and goes. Nighttime creeps over the suburbs, no children in sight. He's just about to go to bed when he spots someone in the corner of the street. Just outside the glow from the streetlights, the figure lurks over by the street sign. The person moves strangely, taking shaky footsteps and seeming to move slightly aimlessly around the pavement, avoiding the light. He opens the curtain wider and peers outside. His eyes definitely aren't what they used to be. He can't really make out who the person is at all. The safe thing to do is stay inside. A man of his age should make sure not to get involved. But the photo of him standing by his Lancaster on the wall tells him something different. The old man straightens up as best he can and walks over to the front door. He doesn't take a weapon with him. 
He won't need one. He will go over and talk to this gentleman, ask him what he's doing hanging around this neighborhood at night, and if things go poorly, he'll walk back inside and promptly call the police. The thrill of the confrontation excites him a little. He's missed this. As the cold night air blows against his face, he feels his youthful energy returning to him once again. He calls out to the man on the corner. The shadowy figure stops pacing and slowly turns around to get a better look at him. The old man can tell even from this distance that the gentleman on the street is a good deal taller than him, but that shouldn't matter much. He'll go over, have some stern words, and that'll be that. If this strange man knows anything, it'll be that he should respect his elders. The old man crosses the road and stands under the streetlight just a few feet away from the man. Frustratingly, his eyes still can't quite make out the man's face. The old man clears his throat and rolls up his sleeves. Sir, this is a residential neighborhood with young children and an excellent relationship with local law enforcement. I would advise you to move along or we'll be forced to call the authorities. But the sound that greets the old man is enough to immediately do away with any of his bravado. His blood runs cold as the figure in front of him starts to laugh. It is a gruff, rasping noise with a slight squelching underneath it. Come to think of it, every little movement this figure makes, there's a little squelch. The laugh stops suddenly, sharply. The figure turns the rest of the way around to face the old man head on. It takes a step forward. Light falls across it, revealing a mass of wriggling, convulsing worms. Millions of small brown worms all weaving in and out of one another, dripping a thick and sticky liquid onto the street. The creature has no face, no features, no skin, nothing. It has the shape of a man, but that is where the resemblance ends. It is utterly inhuman, utterly terrifying. The old man almost topples backward in surprise, but steadies himself. A fall at his age would be very bad news indeed. The creature reaches out a writhing arm toward him. Liquid drips from it onto the sidewalk. A small puff of gas comes up from it as the liquid bubbles, burning a little dent into the stone. So that's what was killing his roses. Fast as he can, the old man turns and hurries back to his house. He doesn't want to turn around for risk of losing his balance. He'll get inside, lock the door, and call the police. They will know precisely what to do. That squelching sound is behind him, taking shaky, inhuman steps to follow him. The old man reaches the front door and slams it shut. He grabs the landline in the hallway and immediately dials 999, the British emergency number. Hello? Uh, police, please. There's a gentleman loitering outside my domicile. He appears to be made of worms. Worms, yes. No, no medication. Just myself. There's a thud at the door, then a second thud. The old man drops the receiver and takes a few steps back. No more thuds. No more noises. Maybe that was a slight overreaction. The old man straightens up and clears his throat. Nothing to worry about. A sizzling sound fills the hallway. The door starts to look... strange. Two patches are appearing on it, the paint cracking and discoloring. The patches start to bulge outwards, and a drop of liquid seeps through. It falls on the welcome mat and burns a hole clean through it. The old man's eyes widen. Worms. Just two or three at first, then a few more, then a dozen more, burrow their way through the door, each dripping with that foul liquid. The holes grow larger and larger, until the creature has two large armholes burnt clear through the wood. The creature grips what remains of the door with its wormed fingers and wrenches the wood apart. It towers over the old man as it stands in the doorway, its surface crawling and wriggling as its feet burn holes into the carpet. The book hits the creature square in the chest, knocking it off balance. The old man throws another book and another. He knew it was a good idea to keep his bookshelf out in the hallway. He grabs another, but hesitates and puts it back, not the first editions. Instead, he heaves the old yellow pages in both of his hands and launches it as hard as he can at the worm monster. The book smacks into its chest with enough force to break a chunk of it apart. The creature's chest bursts open, sending worms flying through the air. Something red falls out onto the carpet. A baseball cap. A child's baseball cap, half digested. The old man gasps and puts a hand to his mouth. The worms splattered against the wall start to slide down towards the carpet, eating through the wallpaper as they go. Once on the ground, they start to crawl and wriggle back over to their body, reabsorbing into the mass from the feet. The creature straightens up like nothing ever happened. He's going to need more than books. Hello? It's the mom from next door. The old man's eyes widen further. I saw your door was still open. I was just wondering if you've seen… The mom appears in the front doorway just behind the monster, takes one look up at it, and freezes. 
She has a rusty old Zippo with a dim flame to light her way. The wormed mass turns round to her. In the same rasping voice that it laughed with earlier, it says one word. Her name. Then it notices something and flinches slightly, the lighter in her hand. For a second, the old man, the mom from next door, and the giant worm monster all look at the tiny little flame. Then it goes out. The creature lunges at her, grabbing her by the shoulders and wrenching her into a ferocious hug. The smell of dissolving flesh fills the hallway as she screams in agony. The old man does everything he can not to throw up. He needs to get out of the house. The back door, he'll go out the back while the creature eats. Step by step, he creeps away from the distracted monstrosity next to his coat rack, trying his best not to be heard. He slides the kitchen door closed and puts a chair against the handle. It's not much, but it'll buy him a few seconds. He turns, rushing to the glass sliding doors at the back of the house, and reaches for the key on the side. Only, it's gone. Of course, he left all the keys under his pillow. The pillow in the bedroom that's right next to… His shoulders slump. He turns back around and sees a crack of light under the kitchen door. A couple of worms are crawling their way under it, gathering together and starting to form on the tiles. That's it then. It's all over. Nothing left for it. The old man lets his eyes wander around the room. That creature is making its way into this kitchen no matter what he does. All he has are a few precious seconds until those worms are big enough to come after him. He wants to spend those seconds the right way. Feeling his ragged breathing starting to find a steadier rhythm, he walks over to that old picture on the wall. Him and his crew, all his best friends, standing young and proud in front of their bomber. He'd experienced this feeling before, this moment. When you know that your demise is guaranteed, it removes some of the panic. The uncertainty of, will I make it? What can I do? Do I have a chance? It's a sickly thing. It leaves you in the lurch, trying desperately to battle against your own nerves. Once it's decided, however, well, then everything becomes a lot clearer. He'd felt this way in the war, when their bomber was shot at while flying over occupied France. They were steadily losing altitude and airspeed as they crossed back over the channel. The seven of them had each taken a quiet moment to say their prayers and look out at the stars flitting above them. Only, they hadn't died. In fact, they were all being incredibly foolish. The solution was so simple that when the old man's rear gunner suggested they just drop all their remaining bombs onto the water to save weight, the group of them had all burst out laughing. One by one, the bombs dropped silently into the sea. They're probably still down there to this day. No explosions. Explosions. The old man smiles. Maybe it's not quite over after all. He looks back at the ball of worms assembling on his kitchen floor. As more worms crawl under the door and join the mass, it takes on different strange shapes. First a mouse, then a rabbit, a cat, a dog. In a moment, it'll be the size of a hog. Rushing over to his gas stovetop, he twists all four of the dials all the way up. They whine and hiss at him, spewing acrid-smelling gas into the air. Already his head starts to swim. He'll have to time this just right. He snatches the trowel and a box of matches up off the countertop and goes to the sliding glass door. This is it. Rasping laughter fills the room as the creature stands to its full height, head almost brushing against the ceiling. The old man can feel himself losing consciousness from all the gas in the room. Bang! He slams the trowel against the glass door. Nothing. Bang! He does it again, still hopeless. The laughter grows louder as he hears squelching footsteps behind him. Bang! This time there's a slight chip. He hits it again and again, trying his best to shatter it. But while the little chip grows into a crack, it's not working. A warm, squishy mass smothers his shoulder. Worms burrow into his flesh, searing white-hot pain throughout his body. That'll have to do. The old man strikes the match. Boom! Glass shatters, flames bloom out of the house, licking the last remaining healthy flowers. Burning worms fly in all different directions, scattered across the lawn, the back fence, and beyond. The old man thuds onto his back, looking up at the billowing smoke making its way up towards the stars, as the scared worms burrow their way back into the ground. He would never understand the monster that attacked him that night. Thankfully, this is where I come in. There is something about fire that unlocks this primal fear in almost all living creatures, and SCP-906 is no different. Nicknamed the Scouring Hive, SCP-906 is the blanket designation for a super colony of worm-like invertebrates that appear to share a semi-advanced hive mind. The individual worms are dark brown in color and appear to have some level of shared intelligence. 
When separated from the colony, the worms will crawl towards its general direction but demonstrate a reduced level of problem-solving capabilities. However, once they are back as part of the group, the scouring hive is a formidable predator. When hungry, this SCP becomes acutely aggressive, secreting a viscous, highly corrosive acid that can eat through flesh, hair, bones, and clothing alarmingly quickly. Capable of adapting its form to mimic other animals and humans, this SCP seems to find a level of thrill in the chase. Able to parrot a very rudimentary estimation of human speech, it can say names and even laugh, which it often does while pursuing its prey. It is theorized that this ability to impersonate others is used to lure subjects into dangerous situations, like young children playing alone in their garden hearing a strange noise from over the fence. While it can take various forms, the scouring hive is at its most lethal when it chooses to attack directly. Taking the form of a kind of carpet of worms, it flows across the ground quickly, climbing surfaces, squeezing through narrow gaps, and finding creative solutions to stalk otherwise inaccessible targets. It has been known to swarm through various circuitous routes like drain pipes and air vents while on the hunt. Once it has reached its prey, it envelops them, coating them in that acidic secretion that rapidly breaks down living tissue into a slurry for the worms to consume. While it is unclear whether this is a genuine reaction or just another instance of parroting, this SCP seems to enjoy gloating at this stage, laughing at and mocking its prey as it consumes it. How a colony of worms has reached this level of cognition is unknown. While tougher than your average garden worms, the scouring hive is not invincible. Susceptible to incineration, freezing, and full-body disintegration, SCP-906 can be neutralized if the need should ever arise. When under existential threat, the colony will begin to undergo a period of rapid reproduction. As long as just a handful of worms survive, the colony is able to rebuild itself quickly. That is why SCP-906 is currently held in secure storage in a 3 by 3 meter fully airtight, acid-resistant box. It is kept at a constant 5 degrees Celsius. At this cool temperature, SCP-906 operates at a much reduced capacity, consuming less food, reproducing at a reduced rate, and moving slowly. Should that temperature ever increase, all SCP personnel are to evacuate immediately and ready themselves to terminate any worms they see with flamethrowers and liquid nitrogen. While this super colony is currently contained, it is unknown whether more instances of these worms exist outside of the Foundation walls, slowly burrowing their way through the dirt towards one another until they have enough to start to feed. Kids get bored. It's just part of growing up. Or at least, that's what their parents would always say. Living in a small town in England, you run out of things to do by your fifth birthday. By your tenth, you want nothing more than to move out. By your fifteenth, Half the kids end up in hospital doing something stupid. The kid entering the churchyard tonight is no exception. As he ducks under the gap in the chain link fence, he catches the corner of his cast on the metal. The cast is already so covered in nicks and scratches that the new tear barely makes a difference. He has been trying to cut the cast off with kitchen scissors for the last three weeks. He'd broken his wrist riding his bike off the roof of his house. It would have worked if it wasn't for the post box being a little too close to the building. His brother calls out to him from up ahead. He's already at the door to the church. The kid hears his best friend shuffling around nervously behind him. He waits for her turn to duck under the fence and follow him into the churchyard away from the road. Even in the middle of nowhere, in total darkness, the kid can tell she's scared to break the rules. The pair of them rush over to meet the kid's brother at the entrance to the church. The older brother grins at both of them. At 21 years old, he may as well be 41. Towering over the two of them, with a few scraggly chin hairs and a tattoo on his neck. They can't imagine what his life must be like. Going to university in London, driving a car, getting tattoos, drinking alcohol that costs more than ten quid and doesn't come from the corner store. What a life! There isn't a door to kick open. The church building is in total disrepair. Only the limestone structure is left standing. The windows have all been smashed in long ago, and the pews rotted away, leaving only some moss creeping its tendrils into every nook and cranny. As the three of them make their way inside, they look up to see the starry night sky above their heads, no roof left intact. In fact, the only part of the building that seems to still be half standing is the tower at the far end. Even in the dark, they can still make out a tight spiral staircase hewn into the stone, disappearing up into the collapsing tower. The kid grins what to explore first. They all split up, wandering around different parts of the church hall. The kid makes a beeline for a toppled-in patch of wall. 
He clambers up onto a window ledge and hoists himself up onto the wall, looking down at the other two. A stone gives way under his foot and almost sends him tumbling, but he throws out his broken wrist just in time to balance himself. Across the hall, his best friend is checking her flip phone anxiously. She'd said earlier in the evening that she needed to be back before 1 a.m. or her parents would be worried. It's already 12.45. The kid's older brother calls out across the church. I need the toilet. I'm gonna climb straight to the top of the tower and do it off the edge. <laughs> Watch out for rain. And with that, he disappears through the little doorway and up the spiral staircases. Very quickly, the sound of his footsteps disappears, leaving the kid and his friend alone together. The kid looks over his shoulder out of the church building. From up on this patch of wall, he is almost at the perfect height to pick an apple from the tree next to them. If he can just stretch out far enough... There, he plucks two apples, one for him and one for his friend. He tosses it to her, but she misses the catch. Looking up at him, he can tell she already wants to go home. He grumbles and jumps down from the wall. The landing jars his leg pretty badly, but he clenches his teeth hard enough that no noise escapes his mouth. He grins at his best friend. She doesn't return it. It's late. She needs to get home soon, and the only way they can get home is in his big brother's car. Fine, I guess it's probably home time. She gives him her best attempt at a smile. The kid walks over to the stairs, sticks his head through the doorway, and calls out. No response. Great. How high do these stairs go? They can't be more than a couple of stories, surely. He calls again. Still nothing. His best friend appears at his shoulder. They both peer up the staircase. It's such a tight spiral that they can't really see anything beyond the first ten steps. It's dark in there, almost too dark to see where they're going. He gets out his flashlight and flicks it on. That should be enough light for the both of them. The kid plants his foot on the first step and starts climbing. The steps feel well worn. They're smooth in the middle and dip down slightly from years of use. One step, two steps, three, four, five. His flashlight dies. He shakes it, knocking the back of it a couple of times like they do in the movies. Nothing. Not even a flicker. He asks his friend if she has a flashlight. She doesn't. So the two of them climb in the dark. Very quickly, the stairs change shape. Or maybe that's the wrong word. They aren't changing shape, they're just shrinking. It's subtle, but definitely happening. The gaps between them are getting smaller, and the undersides of the stairs above are bearing down on the kid's head slightly. The kid stops and turns to his best friend. He can hardly see her at all in the dark. She's just a slightly darker shadow standing a couple of steps down from him. He asks if the steps are getting smaller. She tells him not that she can tell. He insists they must be. The stairs above their heads are getting lower and lower. The space is closing in on them slightly. She says she has no idea what he's talking about. Tutting at her, he takes a couple more steps up the staircase. The cast on his arm tightens. That's strange. He keeps going and, all of a sudden, it feels like a vice. The blood flow is cut off almost instantaneously. His fingers feel cold and start to tingle, his forearm swelling and bulging around the edge of the cast. The pressure building up inside it is ridiculous, feels almost as if… The cast splits apart and falls off. Blood rushes back to his fingertips. He flexes them gratefully, turning to his best friend. Even in the darkness, he can tell she's peering at him intently. He runs a hand over his arm, massaging it gently. That's strange. His arm feels… different from how it did before it went into the cast. There's more hair on it now, and the muscle running along his forearm feels more pronounced. He flexes his wrist. No pain, no stiffness, nothing. He isn't due to get his cast off for another month at least. Those doctors clearly don't know what they're talking about. Are you standing on your tiptoes? His friend asks from behind him. He looks down at her shadow, confused, and tells her no, he isn't. The kid apparently looks taller. Must just be uneven stairs, or a trick of the light. Come to think of it though, his best friend does look a little different standing there below him, even just from her silhouette. She isn't any taller, but her figure looks different. Her voice sounds a little lower. His brother, that's who they're after. They'd get to the top of the stairs, find him, and see what was going on. Must just be some strange optical illusions happening here in the dark. The two of them press on, continuing up the stairs. Step after step they go. They must be up on the second floor by now, surely. But there's no light ahead of them indicating any kind of exit, just more stairs. The kid asks his friend what time it is. He hears her flipping open her phone and pressing a couple of buttons, but no light fills the space. She presses them again and again. Nothing. Her battery must have died. That's the only explanation. She tries to tell him that it was almost on full a minute ago, but he doesn't really listen, because at that moment, he sticks a hand in his pocket to take out the apple he'd plucked. 
Warm goop sticks to his fingers. His back pocket is full of sticky mush. Little creatures wriggle around inside it. Maggots. How had he plucked a rotten apple? It felt fine on the branch. He takes another step, hands still absently hovering over his pocket. A buzzing sound. A couple of flies brush past his fingers. What had they been doing in his pocket? He hears them drift around him and up the staircase, until suddenly, their buzzing stops. He crouches down and squints hard in the dark. He can just about make out two little flies lying on the stair just two steps away from him, both on their backs, legs curled. The kid reaches back into his pocket and feels around. The sticky mush is gone. Just some kind of dry, dusty substance is left. Strangely, the kid doesn't panic. He knows somewhere in his head that everything happening to him is very peculiar, yet he doesn't feel worried about it at all. To be honest, all he really cares about right now is making it to the top of this staircase. He takes off, running two steps at a time up towards where his brother must be waiting. Part of his mind notices that the jarring feeling in his leg from jumping off the wall is gone. No time to think about that now. Up he runs, each stride throwing him further and further. Somewhere behind him, he can hear his best friend muttering something to herself, something incoherent and garbled. Her voice definitely sounds different now. It barely sounds like her anymore. She sounds more like… more like her mother. The kid catches his foot on a step and falls. His best friend clatters into the back of him before she has a chance to stop. The two of them topple over, landing awkwardly on a step, enough to knock the wind out of him. She lies on top of him. Only, it can't be her. It feels like a fully grown woman, not his fifteen-year-old friend. She whispers to him. Her voice doesn't sound scared at all, though. If anything, she seems a little… disinterested. What's happening to us? The kid breathes heavily, struggling to get the air back into his lungs. That's when he notices the smell. Something deathly rotten is filling the staircase. Something moldy and decaying. She seems to notice it, too. The pair of them stand up straight and peer up the stairs. In the gloom, they can see it clearly enough. A person, slumped on the ground. The smell tells them all they need to know about this person. They should run, right now. They should run back down the staircase and out of there. Yet both of them inexplicably and in unison continue walking up the stairs, closing the gap on the corpse. It blocks off two whole steps, lying awkwardly on its side, slightly hunched over as if the person had collapsed in a coughing fit. The kid almost slips over. Something small is under his foot, something metallic. He reaches down and picks it up feeling its shape and knowing almost immediately what it is. He lifts the lid and flicks the red and gold lighter on. A little flame fills the staircase with light, orange and weak, dancing around the stone. It is just enough to make out the flecks of blood coughed out of the corpse's mouth and onto the stone steps. It is just enough to see the scruffy little beard sprouting out of the corpse's face. It's just enough to make out the tattoo on the corpse's neck. The kid looks down at his older brother. Not just his older brother, but his older brother. Whereas before he had seemed like he was forty-one, he now looks like it. Forty-one and dead from something in his lungs. The kid turns to see his best friend. A woman in her mid-thirties looks back at him. Her hair even has a couple of telltale grays. She should look afraid, but her expression is almost blank. But there's a little something there, just enough of an expression to tell him that she's seeing the same transformation on his face looking back at her. The kid reaches up to touch his cheek. A wiry beard meets his fingertips. They should run. They should run back down these stairs and get out of here. Call an ambulance and go home. And yet, the kid flicks the lighter closed, turns around, and steps over his older brother's body. As he walks up the stairs in silence, he hears his best friend doing the same. After five more stairs, his knee starts to give out. Then his hip soon after that. It gets harder and harder to stand up straight, so he lets himself stoop slightly. His best friend's breathing grows softer and wispier behind him. The pace slows down. Each step seems to take more out of him, feeling harder than the last. He needs a rest. That's all he needs. If he can just sit down for a second. His chest clamps in on itself like a vice. Blood hammers in his ears. Sweat floods across his brow in an instant, and the whole world seems to tilt around him. The kid collapses on the ground, feeling his brittle wrist snapping under him. Pain shoots through his body as his chest squeezes tighter and tighter. He rolls onto his back, gasping for air with frail lungs. The kid claws at his sunken ribcage, feeling loose wrinkled skin under his fingertips. With a monumental effort, he flicks the lighter on to see an old woman peering at him through the dark. He can hardly recognize his best friend anymore, as she gently takes the lighter from his hand and steps over his convulsing body. He watches helplessly as she continues gingerly up the stairs in silence. 
She doesn't look back over her shoulder, disappearing around the corner, taking the light with her. Leaving the kid to die an old man in total darkness. With one final gasp of air before his heart gives out on him, he clings desperately to one hope. She's going to make it to the top of the stairs. She has to. It is fortunate in many ways that SCP-723 is in such a remote area. While the church has stood on that site for hundreds of years, for much of that time it has been abandoned. Little is known about the history of the church as many of the events around it have descended into local folklore. What is known about SCP-723 is that it is a spiral staircase housed within an abandoned church building in an undisclosed location in rural England. For all intents and purposes, it is an unremarkable set of stairs. Made from ordinary limestone from the local quarry, the steps are approximately 0.75 meters wide and worn away in the middle, apparently from frequent use. If you were to look at the outside of the church, you would see that the tower containing the staircase is not particularly tall and is in a state of disrepair. Taking a look inside that tower, however, seems to show the staircase extending up beyond the height of the tower, something that seems on the surface to be physically impossible. In fact, how high the staircase itself goes is a mystery to this day, as those studying SCP-723 are yet to find a way to see inside it beyond the first two floors. This is because every object, living or otherwise, that ascends up SCP-723 undergoes a rapid aging process. Organic creatures quickly grow older, die, and decompose on their way up the steps. Other objects behave as if a great deal of time has passed. Batteries and electronic devices go flat almost immediately. Decay is accelerated too, meaning wear and tear take place at an alarmingly fast rate. This renders any conventional methods of exploring SCP-723 obsolete. Sound and video recording equipment running on battery power quickly fail. After many attempts with different technology, recording devices linked to a robust cable were created specifically for trying to record footage beyond the first story of SCP-723. However, the video recordings failed around the second story, and sound recordings failed around the fourth. Living subjects were required to transport these devices up the staircase, and so D-Class personnel were tasked with the job. Across all documented experiments, none of the subjects returned. In each case, a subtle change was noticed in the subjects upon crossing the fifth step. One subject paused, another gasped slightly, but beyond that, there was no physical or emotional discomfort for much of their ascent. Most were perfectly content to climb the stairs once they'd passed that fifth step. In fact, as the D-Class personnel climbed up the stairs and underwent the accelerated aging process, none of them appeared to be outwardly distressed for the most part. They all remained remarkably calm and almost disinterested in the way their bodies transformed before their very eyes. Video footage showed the subject's skin rapidly aging, undergoing conventional wrinkling and deterioration. Diseases appeared to develop at an advanced rate too, as one subject's body, recovered by pulling them back down with the rope they were attached to, contained tumors around the prostate and above the eye that were not present prior to the experiment. This subject was later discovered to have a family history of cancer. For all intents and purposes, it appears as if SCP-723 simply accelerates the natural aging process of the subject's body following the same DNA instructions and deterioration that you would otherwise observe over the course of decades. D-723-7 was the subject to make it furthest up the staircase before the connection was lost. Approaching the fourth floor, the signal grew very weak, but in the noise could be heard a handful of distressed murmurings, including possible references to a door or the door, and to dark and mark. Beyond this point, there is no usable evidence. Local folklore in the area indicates that SCP-723 has been producing the same effect for generations. Stories can be heard from local residents about old church congregations who used to meet in the building and would mysteriously lose grandparents, children, priests, and strays who would disappear up the staircase. It is theorized that this is why the church building was left abandoned for so long. SCP-723 was only identified relatively recently, in the early 2000s, after reports surfaced of local children going missing in its vicinity. In response, the area has been cordoned off and designated as Site-288. A three-mile chain-link fence was erected around the churchyard with signage warning any visitors to steer well clear. A further two-mile restriction zone with magnetic locks is scheduled to be constructed in the near future. Three guards are stationed around SCP-723 at all times of the day. None of them openly carry any weapons, so as not to arouse much attention from any passersby, presenting the site as a mostly uninteresting, unsafe, derelict building. The guards are not permitted to approach or ascend the staircase, and the same goes for any SCP personnel. 
the only people permitted to enter SCP-723 are D-Class personnel, specifically approved by Foundation personnel with Level 4 clearance or higher. While little is known about the cause of the effect, or how SCP-723 physically works, one thing is certain. No person who has started to walk up those stairs has ever come back down again. If he breathes, the bear will see him. Lying flat in his stomach, the boy has no choice but to watch as the hulking brute eats his father before his very eyes. Lying in the thicket just a few trees away, the boy knows that any small movement he makes could prove fatal. A bear this large, hunting for its hibernation, will have no issue chasing him down in a split second and doing exactly what it did to his father, to him. The boy is utterly powerless. All he can do is stay deathly still and watch. They'd found the tracks too late. On the way back to camp, they'd been following the wooded cliff that lines the ocean's edge. Bows and salmon slung over their shoulders, they'd been so proud of their catch and the prospect of bringing it back to the tribe that they hadn't kept their wits about them. By the time they'd seen the enormous prints in the dirt, the sound of lumbering footsteps were already echoing through the trees behind them. The boy's bow is too far out of reach. He dropped it when his father pushed him into the thicket. He's got the knife hanging at his side, but he doubts it's long enough to even get through the bear's fatty hide. In contrast, the only thing protecting him from its bite is the leather hide slung across his shoulders and a woven garment from the tribe's elders. One slash of the bear's claw, and he'd be… A breeze ruffles his hair. The boy's eyes widen in horror. That wind hadn't come from in front of him, but from behind, blowing his scent, his fear, directly towards the bear's nostrils. The boy plants his muddy palms into the dirt, staring at the animal. Its nostril twitches, then twitches again. It half turns its head, sniffing the air. Maybe it won't bother with him. The bear's turning back to its meal already. The boy lets out a sigh of relief, and a twig snaps. The bear snarls and whips its head around. For a second, the two of them lock eyes, predator and prey. Then the boy takes off running. Fast as he can, he leaps through the undergrowth, ferns and nettles whipping at his shins. He fumbles the knife out of its sheath and slings the water skin off his shoulder, throwing it wildly behind him. He doesn't know if he hit the bear. He doesn't have time to turn around and see. It's going to be on him in an instant. Up ahead, he sees sunlight streaming through the thick trees, the cliff edge. If he can just get to that, maybe he can climb down and… No, there's no time. Besides, bears are better climbers, better swimmers, better runners. All the boy can hope for is that he's a better jumper. Him and the boys from the tribe have left off plenty of cliffs along the shore, but never these ones. There are too many rocks, too many shallows. But the thundering of four enormous paws behind him is looming larger and larger. He can almost feel the bear's hot breath on the back of his neck. There's nothing for it. Here goes. The trees clear, the sun blasts his skin, a claw slashes at his back, and the boy launches himself into the air. The wind carries him, the weightlessness of wheeling his arms and legs through the empty sky is almost enough to make him laugh with joy, until the boy looks down. The cliff is higher, much, much higher than he'd realized. His momentum carries his torso forwards into a tumble. He's not going to land straight, and he can see jagged rocks everywhere beneath him. The boy closes his eyes and crashes into the sea. All of the air is slammed out of his lungs. His knee hits something hard and sharp in the water. A swell throws him away from the shore and pulls him deep. Without air in his chest, he can't float. Kicking hard as he can, the boy swims upwards, eyes still screwed shut. His face bashes into a sandy rock. No, that's not upwards. Which way is it? Which way should he swim? The ocean current rolls him over and over. Darkness fills his mind. But his feet find a hard surface, and he pushes against it, launching himself through the water, kicking as hard as he can. The darkness fades. Light. The boy's head breaches the water, and he splutters for air, rubbing the water out of his eyes. He looks around wildly. The sea has carried him away from the cliff and out into open water. It's lifting and dropping him with each wave, carrying him this way and that, like a flower in the wind. And there, traversing the cliff face, scrambling down the rocks, is the bear. The boy's stomach turns. It reaches the bottom of the cliff and sees him there in the water. Tipping back its head, it roars at an almighty volume, deafening the boy over the sound of the waters. Even from this distance, the animal looks impossibly large. It dwarfs the boulders that line the water's edge. It slips into the water, barely making a ripple, and kicks off from the shore. Going straight for him, the bear is covering the distance so fast he only has seconds left. 
With barely the strength to keep himself afloat, the boy knows he'll never be able to outswim this creature. Instead, he takes a deep breath and looks up at the woods, remembering all of the happy moments he'd spent in there with his father. A current swells beneath the boy and almost throws him out of the water. An enormous shadow flies through the depth beneath him. A whale? It couldn't be. Whatever it is, the shadow is swimming straight at the advancing bear. So fixated on its prey, the bear doesn't even notice what's approaching until it's too late. The ocean explodes. A blast of water as tall as the cliffs themselves shoots up into the air and showers the boy's head. Somewhere in the midst of the spray, a monster erupts from the depths. Snapping its jaw around the bear, it lifts the animal into the air and throws it against the cliff. The impact is so strong that a small landslide follows the bear's rolling body as it tumbles back towards the water. But the boy has eyes only for the monster emerging from the sea. Crawling up the rocks with one gnarled foot after another, the boy can hardly make sense of what he's looking at. It seems to have some kind of scaly hide, harder than the rocks surrounding it. A wave crashes against the monster as it leers over the bear and sinks its teeth into the animal's hide. Unable to look away, the boy kicks out and starts swimming away up the coast. Only once he's a long way around the bay does he dare to clamber out and back onto land. That night, once the rest of the tribe have gone to sleep, the boy can't help but lie wide awake in his tent. Without his father here, it's just… it's not the same. Quietly rolling up the hide doorway, the boy slips out into the night. They're camped by a small cave with beautiful smooth walls inside. They say it's the cave of their ancestors, the place where all life started. The fire in the cave has to always burn. Fortunately for him, the cave is empty. The boy stares up at the wall in wonder. Finger drawings of animals, hunters, mothers, shamans, gods, and forests fill almost every part of it. Only one space remains in the corner, the finger painting of the rocky cliffs with the swelling sea beneath. Dipping his finger into the paint, the boy sits by the wall and starts to paint. A terrible monster crawling out of the sea, with a scaly hide stronger than any rock. That's it. You know that from just some finger painting. The archaeologist turns to the group of researchers surrounding him in the cave. UV lights are set up all along the walls, with the blue and violet shapes revealed all across the stonework. The archaeologist can't help but empathize with the spiritualism of their long-forgotten ancestors who lived in these caves thousands of years ago. The professor was the one who asked the question. A cold woman, standing well over six feet tall with a crop of fiery ginger hair. To him, she seems less of a scientist and more of a military leader. But what does he know? Walk with me, she says and leads him out of the cave. Personnel fills the surrounding area. Most of them are armed. Cranes lift huge sheets of reinforced lead plating into place. Several mysterious vats line the edge of the forest, each adorned with more warning and hazard signs than you'd see in a nuclear power station. The two of them have to pause for a moment as three tanks roll past them. The archaeologist breaks the silence. You know the reason I started all my research in the first place? Did I ever tell you that story? Every early civilization in the world, whether it's ancient China, Mesopotamia, South America, Northern Europe, all these cultures, you take a look at their mythology and what do you find? The professor ignores him, instead choosing to bark orders at a group of agents talking over coffee. They all immediately dump their drinks and get back to work. What one thing do they all talk about, even though it never existed? Dragons! All these disparate people with no contact with one another, all of them still draw pictures of dragons. The professor stops walking at the edge of the cliff. The pair of them stand there, surveying the vast ocean stretching out in front of them, as researchers, agents, and workers rush around behind them. After a long pause, the professor asks him to proceed. In ancient Hebrew texts, when they talk about God creating the world in seven days, what happens on day five? The professor flicks the hair out of her eyes and replies curtly. God created fish in the sea and birds in the sky. Well, not exactly. Look at the original Hebrew. He created all of the fish that teem in the seashore, but he also created Leviathan, serpent-like monster from the depths, as old as the world itself. You think that's what we're dealing with? Maybe. Or something worse. By nightfall, preparations are operational. Enormous floodlights switch on, one after another, illuminating an enormous steel box with an open lid at the top, surrounded by armed agents, huge net launchers, and several tanks. It all seems a bit excessive as far as the archaeologist is concerned. He isn't officially still supposed to be here, but in all the scramble for the foundation to get the capture site ready, no one noticed that he had stuck around. From the viewing platform several hundred meters away, he has to watch it all unfold through a pair of binoculars. 
Out above the water, suspended from one of the cranes, is an elephant carcass. The professor told him that the foundation had even marinated it for extra flavor. He had only been recruited into this project a couple of months ago, but from what he could tell, it's been an ongoing priority for the foundation for several years now. The scale of the operation of just setting up at this site is already mind-boggling, but they've been chasing up leads like this for years now. Arriving at scenes, they suspect this creature has been sighted in the past and setting up traps for it. He was only brought in out of desperation. The foundation had exhausted all recent hunting grounds and was trying to cast the net even wider. He'd just been quietly working on his university research paper about ancient reptile drawings when the agents had let themselves into his office. But staring through his binoculars now, the archaeologist knows there's no chance of this operation actually working. They have floodlights for crying out loud. No intelligent predator would come anywhere near that elephant carcass. Movement. Not in the waters or any of the lit up areas. No, there's something in the forest line, just behind a group of researchers. He reaches instinctively for his walkie-talkie, then stops himself. How many times had he got jittery before and reported something preemptively? The agents already don't take him seriously as it is. He can't be jumping at shadows. But there it is again, a shape moving fast through the trees. He scans the binoculars this way and that, trying to find it. Just a group of researchers there, some agents there, supply crates, researchers, agents… Wait, weren't there more of them a second ago? He looks closer. Someone's gone missing. He clicks on the radio. Uh, South Lookout Team, report in. Nothing. South Lookout Team? A sickening feeling settles in his stomach. With all those bright lights everywhere, they're casting a lot of dark shadows. He has to do something fast. Running down from the lookout point, the archaeologist takes off running through the trees to the site. He holds his radio up to his mouth as he goes, trying to get anyone to respond. But it's hopeless. The thicket cracks and crunches under his feet as he tries to make his way through the dark woods, ignoring the feeling that crawls up his neck of being watched. A boulder blocks his way. The archaeologist grabs onto it with both hands and hauls himself on top of it, stopping for a moment to catch his breath. From up here, he can see the floodlit capture site. The tanks and cranes still sit rumbling ready to go at a moment's notice, but he can't see any ground crew anymore. He switches the radio to the open channel and calls out for anyone to respond. The professor's voice crackles back at him. What are you still doing here? This is a highly dangerous operation that you don't have clearance for. He yells at her to cancel it. They need to evacuate the site immediately. It's compromised. She laughs derisively and cuts off the channel. No, she has to believe him. People are dying, and more of them will if she doesn't... The archaeologist whispers to himself in the darkness. It's no monster. It's just an innocent creature. You're playing with a power you don't understand. It's strange. For a moment, he swears he almost hears a voice whispering something back to him in the woods. But when he looks around, he's all on his own. He has to keep moving. The creature could be anywhere. Hopping off the jagged boulder, the archaeologist takes off running through the forest once more, looking over his shoulder every few steps. The light must be playing tricks on him. In the darkness, he can't see the boulder he was standing on a moment ago anywhere. He bursts out of the tree line and into the clearing right next to the steel box. A ramp leads up to the top of it, with a large trap door suspended over the open lid. Well, if he wants to be seen and heard, that's where he needs to go. The archaeologist runs up the ramp and waves his hands wildly in the air. The tanks all turn their turrets to aim at him. The crane holding the enormous steel lid for the enclosure looms menacingly above his head. And there, marching out onto the field, looking absolutely furious, is the professor. Her red hair looks more like a ball of flames right now. We need to evacuate the site now! It's here! She snarls and marches up the ramp to meet him, jabbing a finger in the archaeologist's face. He suddenly realizes how much taller she is. You are not jeopardizing our one chance of catching this thing. Get out of the way, or I will have you detained. Besides, what evidence do you have? But the archaeologist isn't looking at her. Instead, his eyes stare in horror at the elephant carcass suspended behind her. There was a huge, reptilian bite mark taken out of it. A testing bite, like the ones given by sharks. She turns to follow his gaze, and all of her rage is washed away in a sickening delight. It's here. A scream from the crane holding the elephant makes them both jump, but by the time they look up at the cabin, all they see is a hulking shadow leaping away into the darkness. The professor clicks on her walkie-talkie and starts issuing commands. No one responds, except the tank crews. She tries again. Radio silence. Now the gravity of the situation really starts to hit her. Eyes wide with panic, she runs off down the ramp, barking into her radio and leaving the archaeologist up here on his own. Suddenly, under all of these lights, he feels very exposed. It could be anywhere in the shadows. 
Footsteps, heavy planted footsteps tremor through the ground. And out of the woods walks the creature. Several meters long, fat from all of its hunting, the beast that would soon be known as SCP-682 slinks into view. It looks up at him, standing there on the trap door over a metal box, and looks like it's almost ready to laugh at how easy this will be. Boom! The tank blast hits the creature square in the torso, knocking it sideways. Boom! 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 The three tanks open fire one after the other, laying round after round into the colossal reptile, kicking more and more dust into the air. Before long, there's a crater in the ground so large that it looks almost like an asteroid hit it. Smoke and dust fill the air. The archaeologist's eyes fill with tears. That majestic creature, roaming the earth long before mankind ever did, exterminated just like that. Cowards. That's what people really are. Cowards. But as the dust clears, a groaning sound echoes around the clearing. The archaeologist shields his eyes and peers into the crater as best he can. But there's nothing there. Boom! He wheels around and almost falls backwards in shock. The SCP is snuck through the haze and leapt onto one of the tanks. It bites and tears at the armored bodywork, doing all it can to destroy it. In a panic, two of the tanks point toward one another and fire, destroying themselves in the process. The creature rounds on the remaining tank and bites down hard on the barrel. The tank fires, the round going straight down the monster's throat and exploding inside its gut. The backdraft from the blast shoots back through the tank, and a puff of smoke trails out of the hatch at the top. And suddenly, once again, the clearing is quiet. Turning back to the archaeologist, SCP-682 slinks towards him, smoke still curling up out of his leering teeth. With heavy, thunking steps, it climbs the ramp towards him, stopping just short of the trap door. The two of them stare each other in the eye, predator and prey. Neither move for a moment. Then it opens its mouth. The archaeologist closes his eyes. Do you know that you disgusting creatures deserve this? He opens them. Did the monster just speak? What do they hope to accomplish by attacking me? He gulps hard. That whisper he heard in the woods, the rock he'd been standing on. They're scientists. Scientists always try to learn more things, understand the world better. We think you can't be killed, so we're there testing their hypothesis. The creature growls. The stench of rotten flesh fills the archaeologist's nose. It takes a step towards him, then another. The archaeologist runs. He'll leap off the other end of the platform. It's a big jump, but he can make it. The predator's breath is on the back of his neck. He jumps, just as the trap door gives way. With an enormous thud, the SCP falls into the steel enclosure. Before it has a chance to move, the crane unhitches the steel lid, and it crashes down into place, sealing the monster inside. The archaeologist lands in the dirt and rolls onto his back to see the professor, wild-eyed and cheering, up in the crane's cabin. He lies there on his back, panting and staring up at the stars. A clunking sound echoes through the clearing and the gurgle of a liquid flowing through pipes. He sits up, adrenaline still pumping through him. The professor has plugged a pipe into the metal enclosure and is running gallons and gallons of liquid into it. He follows the tube with his eyes, all the way to the enormous hazardous vats on the edge of the clearing hydrochloric acid. His eyes widen in horror. The professor laughs at him. Come on, cheer up. We're just scientists, that's what you said. Just testing a hypothesis. A hand clasps around your throat, cutting off your scream. You try to move, but the hands of the two people restraining you won't allow it. You're being dragged towards something monstrous and terrible in the corner, something hiding under a white sheet. You will die a painful death, and the ones dragging you towards it are your parents. As the dewy green of summer begins to fade, the grass drying, the air chilling, and the leaves turning shades of fire and gold, most children's thoughts turn to Halloween. Visions of fun-sized candy bars spilling out of plastic pumpkin buckets, of ill-fitting rubber masks that smell like the back of a party store, of candy apples and ringing doorbells, and terrifying their friends with scary stories. It's a magical time where anyone can be anything, and candy is free to anyone who asks the question, trick or treat. But as those children get older, Halloween begins to lose its magic. They age out of trick or treating and no longer find themselves amused by carving pumpkins or screaming at plastic skeletons in their neighbors' yards. 
They age out of the sense of wonder, and they find that their neighbors aren't as keen to give away candy to someone with a driver's license. But some children hold on to that love of Halloween into adulthood, transforming the childlike joy into an appreciation for parties, more mature scary stories with blood and guts aplenty, and yes, themed baked goods. You're never too old to enjoy a Rice Krispie treat shaped like a ghost. At least, that's what the sorority girl planning the biggest Halloween party on campus at her small university believes. She has festooned the sorority house with fake cobwebs and ghosts made of hanging bits of gauze, with plastic spiders and zombies made of rubber. There are the classic plastic skeletons, the jack-o'-lanterns filled with battery-powered candles, no fire hazards here, and of course, a huge cauldron filled with punch and dry ice. Smoke billows over the sides of the cauldron as she stirs the garish but inviting lime green liquid inside. She has the lights rigged up to give the place an eerie red glow, and has the perfect playlist of Halloween music put together. Now she just needs to wait for the guests to arrive. At first, she worries that no one will come. The first few people to ring the doorbell turn out to be trick-or-treaters, and she sends them away with a fistful of candy bars and a smile. But each time, she is secretly a little disappointed. About an hour after she finished setting up, guests begin to arrive. Even if not everyone at school is into Halloween, there are very few college students who will pass up an opportunity for a party, and before long, the house is filled with dancing pirates, vampires sipping cups of punch, werewolves digging into bowls of chips, and cats flirting with dogs. Everyone is dressed up and embracing the Halloween spirit, and the girl couldn't be happier. She's been so busy playing hostess that she almost forgot to dress up, but she takes a moment to steal away upstairs and put on her costume. A classic witch costume, black dress, black shoes, and complete with a pointy black hat. As she heads back downstairs, dressed up and ready to have a great time, she takes a moment to survey the crowd. It seems like everyone on campus decided to come to her party. The girl is going to get herself a drink and settle in to enjoy her party when she hears the doorbell ring. Someone else is here. But as she walks toward the door, she pauses for a moment an icy chill of dread washing over her. The party guests know that they can just walk right in. That's what they've been doing all night. And it's almost midnight, much too late for trick-or-treaters. Who's out there? She peers through the peephole and sees someone in a rudimentary ghost costume, covered head to toe in a white sheet. Even if it's someone she knows, she wouldn't be able to recognize them like that. She can't explain why, but she has a bad feeling about this person. She doesn't want to be rude, but she wants to let them in even less. She turns back away from the door, ready to let the stranger stand on her porch all night, and finds all of her party guests standing still, staring at the door, staring at her. She tries to laugh it off and get everyone to return to the party, but the energy in the room has shifted. Everyone's focus is on the person on the other side of the door. She walks to the punch bowl, pours herself a cup, and encourages everyone to get back to the party. Instead, a pirate and a mermaid walk to the door, turning the knob even as the girl asks them to stop. They open it, letting the stranger in the sheet inside. The figure glides through the door, moving in a way that seems just a little bit… off. The girl is struck with a feeling that she hasn't experienced since she was a little girl, the sense, deep down in her gut, that something could really be a monster. Whatever she does, she can't let the thing in the sheet get close to her. She doesn't know what will happen the thought of it turns her stomach with a primal sense of danger. She starts to run, but a girl dressed as a tiger grabs hold of her arm, wrenching her back. The girl struggles to free herself, but a man in a vampire costume grabs her other arm, gripping her so tight his knuckles turn white and she can feel the flesh bruising. She pleads with her friends, trying to get them to see reason and release her, but they won't budge. The tiger girl apologizes through tears, but won't let go. As the girl thrashes, pulling so hard to free herself that she worries her arm will break, the figure in the sheet inches closer and closer. She shouts at it, demanding to know who it is, what it wants, why it's hiding behind that sheet. But it doesn't say a word, doesn't give a clue. There's no expression to read, only the blank white fabric. When it reaches the girl, her feet fly out from under her, and she collapses to the ground, yanked forward by an unseen force. Something is pulling her under the sheet. She claws at the floor, trying to drag herself away from the force, but she can't. The party guests watch, helpless, as their hostess disappears under the sheet, until the only thing left is her writhing silhouette and her screams. Then, the screams go quiet, nothing left of the girl but her witch's hat lying on the floor. 
the figure gathers its sheet around itself and calmly walks out of the party. Those unfortunate guests watch their even more unfortunate friend encounter the creature known as SCP-6096. SCP-6096 is a humanoid entity that spends all of its time hidden beneath a large cotton sheet. A vague sense of its shape can be garnered by observing the entity, but its body is hidden at all times, preventing a complete physical description from being recorded. However, Foundation researchers have determined via a cursory examination that the entity is 1.55 meters tall and that it weighs approximately 48 kilograms. The sheet itself is larger than SCP-6096's body, trailing on the ground behind it by at least a meter whenever the entity moves. All attempts to remove the sheet in order to get a proper look at the thing have been unsuccessful. One of the most unusual properties of SCP-6096 is that it cannot be harmed. I don't mean that it is impervious to damage, but rather that any living being that attempts to engage in a behavior that would harm the entity finds themselves unable to do so. This includes, but is presumably not limited to, actions such as attempting to attack SCP-6096, attempting to order others to attack SCP-6096, attempting to trick others into attacking SCP-6096 without their knowledge, laying a trap for SCP-6096, ordering others to lay a trap for SCP-6096, creating an autonomous device that would harm SCP-6096, attempting to leave SCP-6096 unsupervised and in harm's way, and attempting to remove SCP-6096's sheet. Most of the time, SCP-6096's behavior is described as peaceful and docile. As long as there is no danger present, it allows itself to be led into containment and remains there with seemingly no objections. However, every so often, the entity becomes active and will attempt to leave its location. It does so at a steady pace with single-minded persistence as it pursues one specific target at a time. It is uncertain how the entity chooses a target, but so far, it has always been a seemingly random human being somewhere on Earth. Not only does SCP-6096 know exactly who its target is, but anyone who observes the entity during an active period finds that they, too, know who it is seeking out. In addition to this anomalous effect, the person will also find themselves compelled to help SCP-6096 reach its intended target. These targets appear to be the only individuals unaffected by SCP-6096's anti-harm properties. A person that the entity has selected will, in fact, be able to harm it. However, none have managed to successfully do so, mainly due to the protective influence of the other humans caught in the creature's anomalous thrall. But what happens when SCP-6096 reaches its target? Research into this has been largely inconclusive, but a few facts are certain. SCP-6096 will pull the person underneath its sheet until they have disappeared from view. If the victim is conscious, they can be heard fighting, struggling, and screaming in unimaginable agony for up to 40 minutes. Then they go silent and are never seen again. Once its chosen victim has disappeared, SCP-6096 becomes docile and largely immobile again and can be led back to containment. Whatever happens to its targets under that sheet, it is definitely not anything good. SCP-6096 was discovered by the SCP Foundation on September 12, 2018, when police were called to the home of the Malian family in the town of Durham, New Mexico. Samuel and Amanda Malian greeted the officers in a state of distress, claiming that a person wearing a sheet had come into their home and somehow caused their 16-year-old son Desmond to disappear. Authorities spotted SCP-6096 inside the home and planned to remove the sheet in order to interrogate and detain the suspect, but found themselves unable to take another step closer to the thing. Terrified by their inexplicable encounter, they submitted an incident report to their supervisor, who passed it up through the chain of command in the regional government until it landed in the hands of the SCP Foundation. Alongside the police report, the Foundation was able to access security camera footage from the Malian family home. A transcription of the video's contents is included in the official Foundation files. I'll do my best to summarize its events. The home security footage depicts the Malian family sitting on their living room couch, facing the television. Samuel and Amanda watch a program on TV as Desmond idly scrolls through his phone. Outside, a car can be heard pulling into the driveway. Though the driver's identity has not been confirmed, this is believed to be a local taxi driver named Drake Ellen, dropping SCP-6096 off at the Malian's door. A moment later, Samuel draws his wife's attention toward a window. At first, the two are surprised but amused, assuming that SCP-6096 
is some sort of errant Halloween decoration. However, they become increasingly disturbed as the sheet-covered figure approaches their door and begins to knock, so softly it is nearly inaudible. As Samuel gets up to answer the door, Amanda grabs her son's arm, holding him in an increasingly tight grip and refusing to let him pull away. Unable to stop herself, no matter how upset she becomes, she holds Desmond still as her husband lets SCP-6096 into the house. It glides across the floor toward Desmond, who struggles to break free from his crying mother's grasp. Amanda can be heard reassuring him, saying, You just stay still, honey. You just close your eyes. It won't hurt if you just close your eyes. I love you. Desmond struggles harder, but finds himself unable to break his mother's hold. He kicks his legs, knocking his phone to the ground as the sheet-covered entity draws closer and closer. He begs his mother to let him go, but she doesn't budge. His father, through tears, says, Just stay still, son. Just stay still. It won't hurt for long. It can't hurt for long. Stay strong. Stay strong for me. Starting with his feet, the entity begins to cover Desmond with its sheet, pulling him out of sight. Amanda and Samuel watch in wordless, open-mouthed horror, silent screams stretching their faces into masks of terror and grief. Desmond can be heard screaming, thrashing violently beneath the sheet, though what exactly is happening to him under there cannot be seen. This continues for the next 36 minutes, until Desmond has completely vanished. At this point, SCP-6096 wraps itself in its sheet and sits down on the floor, watching the television without a care in the world. Amanda and Samuel, on the other hand, find themselves able to move on their own again and must reckon with what they just saw, what they just participated in. Samuel collapses to the ground, curling up in the fetal position and rocking back and forth in shock. Amanda stumbles backward, keeping her eyes locked on SCP-6096 and dials 911 on her cell phone. They stay right there until the police arrive. At this point, the video log cuts out. After the SCP Foundation was notified of the incident at the Malian family home, Foundation officers administered Class A amnestics to Amanda and Samuel, as well as to all responding officers who encountered SCP-6096. It is uncertain how long SCP-6096 was operating before this incident, or where it could have come from. SCP-6096's containment is strictly under the jurisdiction of Mobile Task Force Zeta-29, Blood Brothers. The anomaly is kept in a standard humanoid containment chamber, located on the grounds of Site-19, where it is monitored by on-site personnel via video and audio recording devices. If any changes in its behavior are noted, they are to be promptly logged and reported. Unlike most anomalies at the SCP Foundation, SCP-6096 is permitted to leave its containment area whenever it chooses. Whenever it does choose to leave, SCP-6096 must be escorted to its intended destination by MTF Zeta-29. Task Force members may use whatever method of transportation is most convenient at the time. While this group is escorting the entity, a secondary team will travel to its intended target, dosing them with a high-grade tranquilizer to render them unconscious. Once the entity has disposed of its target, it will be accompanied back to its containment chamber. There are no easy jobs at the SCP Foundation, aside from the lucky few who get to spend their days playing with SCP-999. But staff assigned to the containment, if you can even call it that, of SCP-6096 report some of the lowest morale levels at the organization. A welcome notice from Charlie Simansky, commander of Mobile Task Force Zeta-29, Blood Brothers, is included in the official file, presumably for task force member eyes only. Nevertheless, I feel it is important that I share the contents of this note with all of you, as they provide a valuable look into the perspective of the members of this unfortunate task force. It reads, And there you have it. Welcome to Mobile Task Force Zeta-29. No need to worry about professionalism down here. The higher-ups couldn't demote me if they wanted to. Apparently, my presence as the head of SCP-6096 containment is beneficial enough to it that me being reassigned would count as harming it. Lucky me. You're probably wondering how we can be shameless enough to say we have this thing under containment. It comes and goes whenever it feels like it, and if it ever decided it didn't want to come back to its containment cell, we have literally no way of forcing it. And yeah, you're probably also thinking that calling that room a containment chamber instead of a hotel room is just as shameful. To that I say, you're absolutely right. There's nothing we can do against SCP-6096. Feel free to self-medicate until you're able to accept that. Don't hold back. You're going to become very familiar with that feeling of gnawing guilt. I know I did, the first time I had to hold the door to a maternity ward open for this thing. 
The idea of containing SCP-6096 is a bad joke. We all decided a long time ago that the only way out of this nightmare is liquidation, decommissioning, neutralization, whatever you want to call it. But that's no walk in the park either. I've stood in that chamber for hours, gun pointed at 6096's head, screaming at my finger just to tighten slightly. Didn't work. You can't harm SCP-6096, no matter how much you want to. You can't even try to start a Rube Goldberg kind of thing to eventually harm SCP-6096. It's just a fact of the world, maybe a semi-o-hazard or whatever it's called. The way I see it then, there are three main ways out of this nightmare. One, another organization, maybe the GOC, takes a shot at it without realizing what they're dealing with. Maybe they think we're transporting something much more dangerous. Maybe they think we're in over our heads with it, and they take it out with a drone or something, blow the thing to hell while we're transporting it. A bomb would kill it easy, I think. It feels weak. This would only work so long as the GOC thinks they're bombing something else entirely. If they knew it was SCP-6096, they'd just be contained too. Two, an AIC deals with it. I don't know if an artificial intelligence is immune to SCP-6096's effects, but the fact that it won't let me tell one of them about it gives me hope. Maybe one day one of those computers gets a mission, and maybe that mission, by complete coincidence, happens to lead them over to this file. Then they use their superior intelligence to set things up so 6096 runs into an accident out of the blue. 3. A target gets lucky. Maybe 6096 goes after a gun nut, and the poor guy gets a lucky shot in before we can hold him down. This almost happened once, but Lopez took the bullet. Poor guy bled out while we were holding the target down for 6096. Maybe it'll happen again? Go better? Maybe, maybe, maybe. Let's be honest. These scenarios aren't scenarios, they're fantasies. The odds of any of these things happening on their own are tiny, minuscule. The only thing that can really do 6096 in, far as I can see, is sheer coincidence. All we can do is wait and hope. Hope for one of us to make a genuine mistake that gets the right dominoes falling. But I wouldn't hold your breath. After all, we're so good at what we do. Of all the anomalies I have studied, SCP-6096 is one that troubles me more than almost any other. I have lost sleep watching the Malian family security footage again and again, each time shocked by the sight of two tearful parents helping a sheet-covered stranger steal their only son, doing who knows what to him in the process. No matter how hard I try, I cannot discern SCP-6096's motives, its origins, or even what its real face looks like. Perhaps it doesn't have one. Perhaps there's nothing under that sheet. The hardest part is knowing that I will likely never know. That uncertainty is so much worse than any of the horrible truths I have uncovered in my years of studying the anomalies that hide in the shadows of our world. Though I may never uncover the answers to the mystery of SCP-6096, there is one thing I know for certain. I will never be able to relax around Halloween. That walking bedsheet might be someone who ran out of time to plan a proper costume and just grab the first thing they could find. Or it could be a faceless horror walking with the relaxed gait of the incomprehensibly powerful on its way to claim another unfortunate soul. The mobile task agent weeps in terror as the nightmarish cartoon figures surround him in the middle of the bright pink, whimsical town pulled out of your childhood fever dreams. Deformed childhood beasts drink greedily from a fountain overflowing with blood. But the agent doesn't fear them. He fears Mr. Hister, the huge looming figure in the yellow cloak, brimming with tendrils, and that awful face beneath the hood, smiling its rotting smile. All around them, children stand trance-like for the ceremony, ready to receive their final judgment, as up above, a door made of mirror floats, surrounded by the suspended floating bodies of the people who weren't so lucky. Mr. Hister leans in. He's got a question to ask, and if the MTF agent can't answer it, something horrible beyond imagination is going to happen to him. That's just how it is when you're dealing with SCP-5853. SCP-5853 refers to a line of packaged taffy candies. Each package contains two candies, one blue with a raspberry flavor and one red with a cherry flavor. The blue candy appears to have no anomalous effects or adverse effects at all, aside from getting stuck in one's teeth. However, the red candy is a different story. Anyone who consumes the red candy and recites a key phrase 
will be teleported to an extra-dimensional shape seemingly identical to the location of Tiki Taffy Town, a 90s-era television show that advertised the candy and has been designated SCP-5853-A. It was the UIU, a branch of the FBI specialized in investigating paranormal occurrences, who first identified the anomaly after they noticed a correlation between the airing of SCP-5853-A episodes and the disappearances of children. The show and its corresponding candy have been linked to approximately 3,500 child disappearances between the years of 1994 and 1999. As the UIU looked into unexplained disappearances during these years, a peculiar pattern began to emerge among several cases. The missing child was most recently seen in or entering a kitchen pantry. The only evidence left behind was a pile of open Tiki Taffy wrappers, specifically the blue raspberry variety. Shortly before their disappearance, the child was watching an episode of the show featuring the character Mr. Hister, and the missing child's parent could hear the show's theme music just before the child vanished. After a UIU operative's child joined the list of missing kids, the case was turned over to the SCP Foundation, along with all of the UIU's findings up to that point. Though episodes of Tiki Taffy Town can no longer be accessed by the public or by anyone outside of specific Foundation-approved testing, there are descriptions of the show's five main characters, or entities, included in the official file. They range from standard children's entertainment fare to imagery that is… deeply disturbing. First, there is the fatherly, patient Mr. Squibbles, a bipedal humanoid with the head of a plush octopus and a wardrobe consisting of khaki trousers and a red sweater vest. He is responsible for imparting each episode's lesson. Next, there is Mrs. Bobble, a stereotypical clown with blue hair, white makeup, a red nose, and oversized, multicolored clothing. She acts as the questioner of the episode's theme or lesson, raising these questions with Mr. Squibbles. The source of mischief in Tiki Taffy Town is Kizzywink, a small entity resembling a bipedal feline with humanoid hands and an oversized head. Though the entity is mischievous, it is also benign and largely childlike in its behavior. Kizzywink has a companion named Franzipans, a small, round, plushy avian with a hammer in place of its beak. Acting as an annoying sidekick to Kizzywink, the entity will fly around the screen and hit the other entities with its hammer beak as a form of slapstick comedy. And then there is the infamous Mr. Hister. This entity is not depicted as overtly hostile, but its appearance is the most troubling in the show. This humanoid entity stands approximately 2.3 meters tall and wears a long, golden-yellow robe with a hood. The entity propels itself through the world with tentacles that emerge from beneath its cloak. Any attempts to produce an official description of the entity's face have proven difficult, due to the notable video distortion effect caused when the entity enters the frame. The closest current description of its face describes it as resembling a misshapen, tumorous human skull. A standard Mr. Hister episode of SCP-5853-A begins like most children's shows, with vivid colors, pleasant lighting, and cheerful music, as the main cast teaches standard lessons such as how to tie your shoes, why it's important to brush your teeth, and the value of honesty. When Mr. Hister enters the frame, however, everything changes. The video quality dulls, the colors become oversaturated to the point of becoming almost nausea-inducing, and the contrast decreases dramatically. The visuals aren't the only thing that change in Mr. Hister's presence. The subject matter also shifts in tone, as Mr. Hister torments the rest of the characters with nihilistic and distressing lessons such as, your parents will soon die, and so will you, and I feel nothing but the nothingness, or the particularly evocative, you may not believe in the slaughter, but the slaughter believes in you. When Mr. Hister leaves the scene, he always recites this phrase, I shall now be departing to the land of right, with the truth of red to be my might. This phrase is thought to be related to the various child disappearances attributed to the show. On January 4, 2000, lead researcher Frank Monroe conducted the first test involving SCP-5853-A. Accompanied by junior researchers Tracy Klaus and Morgan Eskew, and supervised by Ethics Committee consultant Jennifer Lamb, Monroe began the test with D-Class 643980 restrained to a detainment chair in the middle of an observation room placed in front of a television set. D-643980 was also hooked up to standard medical equipment to measure his vitals, while the junior researchers scanned infrared, ultraviolet, and other frequency wavelengths of the television program for any anomalous activity. 
With this setup in place, lead researcher Monroe signaled for the test to begin. The television was switched on and began to play Tiki Taffy Town Season 1 Episode 3, the first on-screen appearance of Mr. Hister. As the episode began, everything proceeded normally, aside from a small increase in Hume levels. As it progressed, however, the D-Class became increasingly agitated, his heart rate and perspiration increasing. He demanded to know why the show was chosen, explaining that he had childhood memories of the program. His younger brother used to watch the show all the time, until he disappeared. Upon hearing this, Ethics Committee consultant Jennifer Lamb became visibly distressed, but advised the research team to proceed with the test in spite of this unforeseen emotional component. After the episode finished, D643980 was freed from his torso restraints and given a microphone, earpiece, receiver, and shoulder camera mount. He was then given a package of SCP-5853, at which point he remarked that he ate them as a child, but only ever ate the raspberry flavor, while his brother preferred the cherry. He was instructed to eat the cherry piece, then recite the phrase, Flesh is not the truth. At this point, the theme song of Tiki Taffy Town filled the room, and the D-Class vanished from sight, disappearing from the observation room altogether. Dr. Monroe was able to maintain communication with D-643980 via the microphone and receiver, and the research team monitored his video feed. The D-Class began in a dark place, with one single stream of light splitting the center field of view. After some resistance, he continued into the unknown, stumbling out of Mr. Squibble's treasure chest. Upon exiting the chest, the larger landscape could be seen, an exact replica of the Tiki Taffy Town set with a blank white backdrop covering any areas not usually seen by the audience. As the members of the main cast, with the exception of Mr. Hister, entered the area, the D-Class hid in the chest. The four chattered excitedly about an upcoming town meeting before Mr. Squibbles opened the chest and discovered the D-Class hiding inside. He was instructed to engage with the entities until the Foundation could come up with an appropriate extraction plan. The D-Class became distressed and swore, prompting Mrs. Bobble to turn a glowing red until Mr. Squibbles calmed her down. Kizzy Wink asked the D-Class his name, and he answered that it was Davy. At this point, the entities instructed Davy to follow them to the town meeting, where he would be their esteemed guest. Together, they left the house, entering an area made up of the miniature town from the show's opening sequence, only grown to full scale. In the background was the same vacant white backdrop, as well as seemingly infinite copies of the same town landscape. Davy and the group followed a long road toward a cobblestone town square. As the research team watched the video feed, they could see that other pathways in the background were occupied by their own versions of the main cast of characters, all walking toward the same central location. These groups were accompanied, much to the horror of the research team, by small children. Each of the houses along the path was printed with a number corresponding to an episode of Tiki Taffy Town that featured Mr. Hister. According to the research team's calculations, this amounted to 31 episodes of the show that were actively able to steal children. Dr. Monroe suggested sending in a mobile task force, but Jennifer Lamb refused to sign off on the request, concerned about the unknown nature of the location and the potential ramifications of sending MTF members inside. While the research team was debating about the next steps, Davy and his new friends reached the town square. There were over 100 entities and 200 children gathered together there. Some children were weeping, others stood silently, eyes ringed with dark circles from lack of sleep. Every single one of them looked utterly terrified. The entities began to chant together, I now arrive to the sea of sin, with the red of my flesh to offer him. A mirror-like rectangle appeared above the town square's fountain, spinning until it blurred into a black void. Then, Mr. Hister emerged from the darkness. Mr. Hister addressed the crowd, calling out, My children, it is time to tell Mr. Hister what lesson you learned today. He selected a young girl from the crowd and asked her to recite the lesson she learned. She answered, repeating a lesson from Mr. Squibbles concerning the importance of tying one's shoes. Mr. Hister replied, Your prize is to pass through the mirror and into the dreamlands. He lifted the girl into the air and tossed her into the mirror behind him. She screamed and disappeared. He proceeded to call up child after child, asking them to repeat the lesson that they learned. When they answered, they were tossed into the mirror. If the child couldn't remember their lesson, however, 
Well, the less that is said about that, the better. Before long, the fountain was filled with deep red water, which the other Ticky Taffy Town entities greedily slurped up. Eventually, Mr. Hister turned to Dave, asking him what lesson he learned. Dave struggled to answer, guessing a phrase that Mr. Scribbles said, Don't make Mrs. Bobble upset, lest you fail his hideous test. This was the wrong answer. Mr. Hister lifted Dave into the sky, where he was suspended upside down alongside other humanoid figures, one of whom he recognized as his long-lost younger brother, Jeremy. At this point, Dave stopped responding to Dr. Monroe and his research team. The camera feed remained active for three days, suspended upside down next to Dave's body. On screen, a continuous stream of red liquid, presumed to be blood, could be seen flowing over the lens. The feed was cut short, and Dave was presumed lost. As harrowing as it was, this initial test provided the SCP Foundation with some vital information on the inner workings of SCP-5853-A. They were able to determine that, depending on the answer a stolen victim gives, they will be able to affect their own fate. If the victim answers Mr. Hister's question, what did you learn today, with the intended lesson imparted in the episode, they will be passed through the mirror. What awaits them beyond it, no one but Mr. Hister knows, but it is unlikely to be anything good. If the victim answers with a lesson they learned while inside of the extra-dimensional space, they will be left to hang upside down with Dave and the rest of those suspended in the air. If they don't remember or lie about forgetting their lesson, they will be consumed by the entities. But there is one way out. If the victim answers by repeating or summarizing Mr. Hister's darker lesson from the episode, the victim will be released from the extra-dimensional space and transported back to the place they vanished from. For example, UIU Agent Mathis's son, Thomas, reappeared in the kitchen pantry of his home on January 8, 2000, after he did just that. Following the D-Class exploration of Tiki Taffy Town, Dr. Monroe reached out to Jennifer Lamb, requesting that she reconsider her decision to decline MTF operations in the area. She refused to change her mind, telling him to scan media spaces, recall the candy, and call it a day. With the Ethics Committee refusing to approve MTF action, Dr. Monroe instead reached out to his friend, Terence Bazarian, who occupied an MTF Alpha position. He managed, via appealing to Terence's role as a parent, to convince him to agree to an off-books, three-man mission into the spatial anomaly of SCP-5853-A. The small, unofficial mobile task force began its operation on January 20, 2000. Frank Monroe served as commanding officer. Terence Bazarian acted as team lead, Alpha. Robert Falk as right flank, Charlie, and Mohammed al Abi as left flank, Delta. Each member of the team was instructed to consume a piece of cherry-flavored Tiki Taffy and recite the phrase, You may not believe in the slaughter, but the slaughter believes in you. Soon after, all three men were transported into the world of SCP-5853-A. They climbed out of the toy chest to find the cartoonish kitchen, the busily decorated living room, and the door to the outside area. The MTF team got to work investigating the area immediately, making note of the fact that all of the items in the house were fake, simply props for a children's show. The door to the set began to open, and the three MTF members hid out of sight. Monroe warned them to not, under any circumstances, engage with the entities in any way. The cast, with the exception of Mr. Hister, entered the room and began checking the area for signs of new children transported to the world. Alpha was discovered first, and opened fire on Mr. Squibbles, who stumbled backward, leaking brown fluid until it collapsed. The remaining entities began to scream as the area dimmed to black. Suddenly, everything was dark and silent. The MTF feed switched to night vision as Delta, Charlie, and Alpha began to explore the area. Monroe ordered them to get to the town center as fast as possible and tell Mr. Hister the key phrase so that they could be transported back to the SCP Foundation site. As he delivered the instructions, his audio feed began to degrade until the MTF officers could no longer hear him. Left alone in Tiki Taffy Town, they had to proceed on their own. As the officers resumed motion, Franzi Pans flew at Charlie's head at top speed, its hammer beak colliding with the man's head and sending him careening into a nearby wall. The impact was fatal, and Agent Charlie collapsed to the ground, dead. Agents Alpha and Delta continued firing on Francie Pans, and Alpha ordered Delta to head toward the door and make his way out. 
When he reached the door, however, Mr. Squibbles was waiting on the other side. It grabbed Agent Delta as an instance of Kizzywink used its claws to kill him. In a heroic dying act, Agent Delta pulled the pin from one of his incendiary grenades and charged at Mr. Squiggles, blowing them both up. Agent Alpha was the only one left standing, alone with Mrs. Bobble the Clown. She charged at Alpha as he fired a grenade round that subdued her. Taking his moment, Alpha escaped the building, navigating his way through the pitch black landscape. Alpha used his night vision view to navigate a narrow path toward a single light in the distance. He walked for approximately 182 minutes, at which point he remarked on the sensation of the path deepening, lengthening, and pulling him down. He began to approach the town square before everything faded to static. When Alpha's video feed returned, he was standing in front of a white wooden door. He reached out to open it and spotted a woman that appeared to be Jessie Bazarian, his wife, sitting in a rocking chair and humming a lullaby to the infant in her arms. He attempted to speak to her, but she addressed him in the manner of Mr. Hister, saying, See the mirror, through the mirror. The mirror is the only salvation. Salvation achieved by sacrifice to he who is divine among the dreamlands. Release yourself through the mirror. Ascend through the mirror. Transcend through the mirror. Alpha screamed, collapsing to the ground. When he regained consciousness, he was face to face with Mr. Hister himself. The entity smugly asked, Terence, what did you learn today? Rather than reciting the key phrase and attempting to return home, Alpha pulled the pin from his remaining grenade and let it fall to the ground. The video feed cut out, and the entire mobile task force that entered Tiki Taffy Town that day was presumed dead. Two days later, Dr. Frank Monroe sent out the following email. To whom it may concern and see Miles, I regret to inform you that I am no longer able to fulfill my duties as researcher. I have come to the realization that Lamb was right, although I don't agree with her. I can't keep trying to save the world from the things we study. It's not about how far I can probe, it's for our own protection. I need to know when to call it quits. I could spend X number of dollars and X number of lives sacrificing to whatever to wherever I think, or wherever I think the mirror may bring us, who Mr. Hister might be, or the implications of a clown entity called Bobble. I could try to chase these down to their penultimate conclusion, sacrificing MTF, D-Class, and innocence alike. Lamb, she was right. God, I'm sorry, Terence. All SCP-5853 needs is to be hidden in the dark. I'm sorry, I'm just not made for this. Not anymore. I can no longer do this. Let me forget. Let me go back. Consider this my resignation. Respectfully, Dr. Frank Monroe. After a review by the O5 Council, Dr. Monroe's resignation request was denied. All SCP-5853 products have been publicly recalled. Any instances of SCP-5853 are to be kept in a standard containment unit in Secure Facility 64, Wing F. If any instances of SCP-5853 are discovered being sold, the sale must be intercepted immediately. Every episode of SCP-5853-A has been removed from the air, and television broadcasts and online video sites must be scanned regularly in order to prevent further spread of the materials. No Foundation personnel, including D-Class, that have or are considered having children may be assigned to SCP-5853. The SCP Foundation has attempted to uncover the identities of production staff and actors from the show, but so far, the investigation has turned up nothing but dead leads. A close analysis of the show's credits showed that, rather than a list of staff that worked on the episode, they consist of a constantly growing list of names. These names include those of children reported missing, as well as individuals yet to be identified. On January 23, 2000, the names Robert Falk, Mohammed Al-Abi, Terence Bazarian, and Frank Monroe were added. Frank Monroe was pronounced missing in action, and to this day, has never been found. Check out the Dr. Bob Patreon and become a junior researcher today. Now go and watch another entry from the files of Dr. Bob, like SCP-1357, The Children's Park.